All right, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today for our workshop on federated learning and TensorFlow federated. I'm very excited to be here with you and to tell you all about the interesting, cool things we are doing at Google. I'm a researcher at Google, and I'll have a lot of my colleagues and friends explain many of the concepts that you are looking for. But before we jump into our tutorials, I wanted to tell you a few pieces of information that are going to be helpful for you to better understand uh, how we're going to run this tutorial. First, if you have questions, we welcome your questions, but we want you to post them on Dory. Dory is the tool that Google uses for Q&A. So please find the link on our website and make sure you can access Dory and post all your questions on Dory. If you cannot access Dory, please send us an email at uh, Federated uh, Learning Workshop 2020 at google.com, and we'll try to give you access as soon as possible. So, for today, this is our schedule. I'll start by introducing federated learning and explaining the general concepts of federated learning. And then I'll hand off to Chris, who's going to tell us a bit more about TensorFlow Federated, the tool that we're all here to learn more about. And then we're going to start our uh, tutorials. We'll build up uh, gently, and we'll do an introduction to TensorFlow Federated with Nova and Emily, and then we'll go into more advanced concepts with Wei Kong and Zach. Here's a big shout out to our amazing speakers today. They've been working hard over the past few weeks to make this happen. Emily, Nova, Wei Kong, and Zach, and you'll learn, uh, you'll hear more from them soon. All right, so. Why are we all here? We're all here because we all love machine learning. We all like artificial intelligence. And as we all know, AI and machine learning thrive on data. Data is very important to train machine learning models, recommendation systems, and do great things. Um, data is born at the edge. Data is born on people's devices, cameras, microphones, smart cars, all the appliances that you have around you at home and in your city. And this data is very useful for AI and machine learning, but it can be also very sensitive. It can carry very personal information, and there's a real danger of collecting this data and putting it all in one place. And that's why the fundamental question that we are trying to tackle here is, is it possible to continue to do AI and machine learning and build services and amazing uh, uh, models without collecting and storing this data and putting it in, in one place. This is not only important for privacy, it's also important to improve latency and to improve the battery life. Instead of having to ship all the data from devices to the service provider back and forth and build all these services, if we can do it all in a decentralized fashion, we can gain on all these fronts. We can have all these advantages. And that's essentially what led to the birth of federated learning. So here's the definition of federated learning. Federated learning is a machine learning setting. It's an AI machine learning setting where multiple entities collaborate in solving a machine learning problem under the coordination of a central service provider. So there's the central service provider who's trying to coordinate a number of entities that are trying to learn a combined machine learning model on their combined data set. And here's the catch. The catch is that the raw data is stored locally. It's never exchanged or transferred. So the users or these clients never exchange their data with each other or with the server. Instead, only focused minimal updates are transferred back to the service provider. So this is still at a high level, and you may have a lot of questions about it, and I'll dig a little deeper into it in a bit. But first, let us see the two different types of federated learning. The first one is the one that Google has been focused a lot on. It's called the cross-device federated learning. And as the name indicates, it's the setting where you have a lot of devices. These devices, you can think of them as smartphones. You can think of them as tablets or computers or maybe sensor uh, networks of, 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 uh, of small little sensors. Um, so you have possibly millions hundreds of millions or even up to a billion, maybe 10 billion in the near future of these devices that are carrying very sensitive information. And as you can see on this slide, the server is trying to coordinate between clients amongst each other to train the model. And then once we're done, we deploy these models on select devices. The other main application of federated learning is this uh, cross-silo federated learning. Here, we don't have devices. We're not talking about 
phones or tablets or computers. We're talking about institutions. Think about this as hospitals or banks or schools. You can have tens, maybe hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands at most of these institutions. These institutions have slightly more powerful capability and have larger data sets because every hospital can have medical records for possibly tens of thousands of patients. And it's the same concept. These institutions do not want to exchange and share information amongst each other or with a central service provider. And so they engage in this federated learning to train and learn this combined model that's going to work well for everybody. All right, so before I dive into the details of federated learning, it might make sense to recall how classical machine learning in AI works. So how does mo model development work typically? So typically you've gathered data, you've cur curated a data, and it's placed in the cloud. You can see it here on the slide, there's this cloud data, and there's an engineer who wants to build a machine learning model or some type of an AI model. And the engineer is going to submit a job in the cloud to train a model of some size or architecture with some number of parameters, with some hyperparameters, so on and so forth. And we're going to use some machine learning framework to train the model on the data that sits in the cloud. So you do train and evaluation. Maybe you try a bunch of hyperparameters. And you then examine the model that you've obtained. You make sure that it works well at least on some held out set, and you check some metrics, maybe you do some A-B testing, and once you're very happy with the quality of the model that you've trained in the cloud, you can deploy it to devices. And it can be used on people's devices to reduce latency and bandwidth and save uh, on battery. So this is the workflow that pretty much a lot of us are very familiar with. This is the classical workflow of machine learning. And in some sense, federated learning is very much the same. We don't want to change this workflow in, this, in the sense that we don't want the engineer to have to learn new concepts or new ways of submitting jobs and, and training machine learning models. In fact, we want to build an infrastructure so that the engineer would not have to worry at all about this whole process that's happening under the hood. So let me try to tell you how we do it in federated learning. So in FL, because the data does not sit on the cloud, it's distributed on people's devices, as we said before, it's going to be a little challenging because we have to do some orchestration back and forth between the service provider and these devices in order to train and evaluate the model that we're trying to learn. And so here's how we do it in a few quick steps. So devices often check in to our servers and they say, hey, I have data. Do you need me? Do you want to train your model on my data? And oftentimes, because our servers get a lot of requests and a lot of pings, they respond, the server responds saying, not now. I'm busy with other clients. But every now and then, the server says, yes, I have work for you. I want you to compute or update a model for me on your data. That's when the device checks in to the process of federated learning. And so what happens is we start from a model. This model can be either initialized randomly. So we start from a random initialization, or we uh, can pre-train it on some data that's publicly available. So you can pre-train the model on some publicly available data. And so you send a copy of that model to the device. And on that device, you use the local data to update this model. And we'll talk a little bit about it in a bit, how we do this local training on the device. So we're actually improving the model on the device. And once we're done improving the model on the device, the device sends back an update back to the server. Now, this is something I would like to emphasize. These updates that we send back are ephemeral, meaning that we never store them, we never lock them. They're only stored for a few minutes until they've been aggregated and then we erase them. And that's important for privacy. So these are focused updates because we're not shipping the data. We're only shipping the updates of the model parameters. And that's important for privacy. Now, um, so, so this is the ephemeral. Now, as you can see here uh, in this round, there are many devices that have participated. 
that have sent their updates back to the server. And so the server takes all these model updates from the devices, aggregates them, combines them together to obtain an improved model. So you can see here on the slide, there's this combined model that is hopefully better than the initial model that we started with. And so here's where the engineer can try a few things. Perhaps you can test the efficiency of the model or the accuracy of the model. You can do some evaluation and check some metrics. And oftentimes, one round is not enough. We'll see that we need many rounds. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a bit. So what we end up doing is we end up um, kicking off another round. So now, instead of starting from an initial copy that is randomly initialized or pre-trained on publicly available data, we're going to use what we have learned in the previous round to do another round of federated learning. So again, we send this model to devices that have checked in. They take this model, and they train on it, and then they send back updates. And so we get another combined model that's hopefully even better. And we can repeat this process many, many times. You can think of it as possibly hundreds, if not thousands of times, of going back and forth between the server, aggregating updates, combining the model, and then broadcasting it to a number of checked-in devices that would each update the uh, combined model locally on their device. Now, I told you I'm going to give you some orders. So here are some numbers. Uh, we usually do anywhere between 100 to uh, you know, tens of thousands of rounds to get a high quality model. And then uh, we need typically about anywhere between 100 to you know, thousands, tens of thousands of users, of clients checked in to train and get, again, a good uh, combined model in every round. And typically, we operate on the order of about anywhere between a minute to 10 minutes per round. And this is all in the context of the cross-device federated learning. Of course, in the cross-silo federated learning, you will end up having different orders because you don't have phones uh, or computers. You have institutions. So it's a different dynamic altogether. Now, one thing I would like to also emphasize on this slide is this back and forth process between the service provider and these participants, these clients that have data that are uh, participating in the federated learning. So one round of taking the model, shipping it to devices, training on the device, and then sending back the updates and combining them on the server, that's, an, uh, that's we call it a process. And the fact that we're going to do it many times, hundreds if not thousands of times, that's an iterative process because we are iterating that process many, many times. And you'll hear from Chris and other presenters later on today uh, more about the concept of an iterative process. All right, so what I described is very general. It applies to any computation you can think of on the device and any aggregation method you can think of on the server. But one very popular algorithm that we have been using and many others have been using is called the federated averaging algorithm. And in this algorithm, what we do is we run an, some number of stochastic gradient descent steps. Stochastic gradient descent is a method for doing optimization, which is necessary for model update on device. So if we run multiple steps of SGD or stochastic gradient descent on the device, we get an improved model on the device. And that's how we can ship back the update to the server. And then if we simply just average these updates and around, we get the algorithm that's now become so popular and it's called federated average. And you can learn more about it by checking the paper that I'm linking to in this slide. But we can do far more than just federated averaging. We can do a number of computations on device, a number of optimization fr frameworks on the data that's on the device. And we'll hear more about it in this tutorial as we progress. So one thing we can do is analytics. Instead of focusing only on uh, training deep learning uh, neural network models from decentralized data, we can compute some uh, statistics. We can compute things like the mean or the mode or a histogram or try to find the frequent elements. We can do some data science and data analysis on this highly distributed data. And this is now uh, known as federated analytics. And it very much, very much meshes with federated learning. Now, there's a lot that I would like to tell you about, but this is a tutorial focused on TensorFlow Federated. 
If you would like to learn more about uh, federated learning, please check out our uh, paper, which is on archive. I have the link on this slide. And now I'm going to hand it off to Chris, who's going to tell you about TensorFlow Federated, the philosophy of the design, before we move on and uh, to our presenters. OK. Thank you, Peter. All right, so um, as Peter explained, federated learning is an area of active research. So there is a lot to explore, and that's why we've built TFF, to explore it together. Um, so TFF is a, a new framework for what we call federated computations. Those are computations on data that is born decentralized and stays as such. And federated learning is just one example. We see others later. Um, TFF is also designed to be a short foundation for what we um, uh, for, for the various um, research, research uh, in production users at Google. And um, I'll get back to this later. We use it internally at Google, but we'd like to also uh, build it with your help to support your use cases. Um, so you can think of TFF as having three parts. Essentially, first, there is a layer of uh, core abstractions uh, for building further computations. Um, on top of this, uh, you get a layer of um, higher level APIs. Um, with implementations of federated learning algorithms. And finally, there's a runtime and simulation components uh, with things like data sets, training loops, and what. And um, CAND APIs are really all that you need to get started. And in just a few minutes, Emilia and Nova will um, uh, tell you how you can um, run a little experiments in TFF with just a few lines of code. So it can be really simple. Um, but before we get to that, let's uh, maybe take a small peek under the hood, uh, just you know, a little journey down the rabbit hole um, to build some intuitions that I think will be helpful during the tutorials. And if anything is confusing, don't worry about it. The details are not important. So you will hear all of this again later very shortly. All right, so let's take a look. First, what is a federated computation? Well, in a nutshell, it's a computation where the data stays on device where it was born. So. Um, the clients here are potentially have sensitive data. They're anonymous. Um, they're interchangeable. They come and go all the time. Um, they do all the work, but they always work together. And the server is responsible for making that happen. So server helps the clients form cohorts. Um, it aggregates updates across clients, as you saw in Peter's slides. And it also carries state across rounds. You heard about those you know, thousands of rounds as, as things evolve while clients come and go. That's the server's role to make that possible. Now. Um, this is perhaps best explained on an example. And so here's one that is uh, different from predated learning. Um, so I, I imagine you have a set of uh, client devices that have temperature sensors and um, they all um, have some sensitive data. Now the analyst in the server wants to know what fraction of the clients have temperatures above some threshold, um, right? So now imagine the data is uh, sensitive. Uh, so you can't just go ahead and collect it. Um, so what you're doing instead is uh, broadcast the threshold to the clients. And now that every client has a threshold and its own temperature reading, the client can do their work. So in this case, um, the work will be computing one if it's above the threshold and zero otherwise. You can think of this as a map step in MapReduce because again, all the clients do the same thing, they all work together. So now that you have those ones and zeros, all that it's left to do is just aggregate them and um, this was the average on the server and um, that's it. That's the result you want. Of course, if you have lots of clients, you may have to repeat this many times to get a more accurate estimate, but that's in a, in a nutshell what uh, Federated computation looks like. And you can recognize some of those properties that I talked about, clients working together, server orchestration, and so on. All right, so uh, why do we need framework for this? Um, why don't we just go ahead and write it in Python, uh, you might ask. And, and, uh, and, and that's indeed what we did at first. And we just found it not very convenient um, for a number of reasons. First, we're dealing here with data that's distributed, right? So we talk about temperature readings as an input, but that input um, exists in many places on all the clients. And so you can think of it as a sort of a distributed or a federated float, if you will. Um, another problem is that um, we have inputs on the clients, input on the server. So um, this computation doesn't just run in one place. It runs kind of all over the network, right? So it's a little distributed system. And the communication here that you're looking at is not just an implementation detail. It's actually an integral part of the logic of your computation. So to support things like this well and make them easy to, to build, uh, you need a distributed programming framework like TFF. And so here's a little example of uh, what, uh, how you can express this, this temperature sensor thing in TFF. Um, you start by writing a Python function. You declare all the inputs wherever they are, so client side or server side. And now in, in the body of this function, you can invoke the various um, federated operators, communication operators, just like those that you saw in the diagram. So you can recognize the broadcast, the mapping operator, and the aggregation, the mean. Um, in all the work that's happening, 
on the individual devices is um, expressed in plain TensorFlow, uh, since it's a TensorFlow uh, framework. Um, so that's it. That's essentially what uh, the code in TFF looks like whenever we talk about code in TFF. This is it. Um, and uh, again, details don't uh, matter here. Um, you will hear again in one of the tutorials later from Zach um, all the same concepts repeated uh, again. So, so that uh, don't worry if it sounds confusing. But this is essentially when we talk about code in TFF expressing federated learning algorithms. This is this is the code. So now, uh, what you saw um, looks like Python, but in, in fact it isn't. And if you're familiar with um, graph mode in TensorFlow, it's basically the same idea. So TFF translates um, this Python-looking code into an internal representation in the TFF's internal language. Um, um, what that gets you is uh, that you can write your code just once, and, and then you can deploy it anywhere, right? So you can run, run it in a co notebook, you can run it in a cluster on GCP, you can deploy it on device. Uh, in particular, the, the important thing is that you, if you have your research ideas expressed in TFF, as you want to move them into production, you don't have to change your code because it's, again, the same code running anywhere you want. And uh, so that's that's kind of nice. Um, and it's important to kind of keep in this in, in mind, especially if you're used to eager mode in TensorFlow, because not just TFF, but federated computations in general are just fundamentally not eager, right? So you're, you're, the code that they're writing I shouldn't assume it will run in your collab notebook. It, again, it may be running on a cluster, or it may be running on device on Android. And that has uh, various implications, as you can see. Um, so uh, when you go through the tutorials and see a bunch of codes in what looks like Python, in fact, you will be looking at code in three different languages mixed together. So there will be your model in TensorFlow. There will be federated learning algorithms in TFF language, constructed perhaps for you if you're using the Count APIs. And finally, there will, be, there will be a little bit of actual Python, and that will be basically just the simulation logic. So looking over around, selecting clients randomly in each round, and et cetera. Now, uh, you, see, you see an example of this in a minute. But uh, before I get there, I would like to highlight just one more important property of TFF that, that is important to understand, uh, is that it's a purely functional programming language. And so there's really no such thing as state in TFF. Uh, there is no such thing as variables. Uh, state in distributed systems in general is a huge can of worms. We don't want to open it. Um, functional programming makes it much easier. And so in TFF, if you, when, if you need state, uh, you just model it as both input and output of your computation. Um, you can have variables in TensorFlow in TFF. Uh, you, you need them for things like gradient descent, but um, uh, they behave like locals, so they don't persist across calls. And one example of an important functional abstraction um, that, that we use a lot in TFF, and again, you will do, use, uh, you will see this in the Emily uh, Novas tutorial, is the iterative process. Uh, so an iterative process is essentially just a pair of computations. One of them produces an initial state of some sort, and the other one models a single step of processing that takes that state and then produces an updated version of that state. Then you just run it in a loop. And that's essentially all there is to it. Um, uh, you'll see examples of iterative processes for things like federated training and so on. OK, but back to our three languages in one example. So what you'll see in tutorials in just a few minutes is you'll start with some code in TensorFlow. Next, um, you will be looking at code in TFF, perhaps created by calling the Kande APIs. And that will represent your federated learning algorithms that you're playing with. And finally, you'll see a bunch of actual Python simulation logic. So first. Uh, you will re request um, creation of the initial state of, for example, federated training process. And here, Python will be calling under the hood the TFF runtime to execute the TFF code for you. Um, and then you'll uh, be looking at a little for loop that iterates over rounds of a computation. And each, in each round, it, um, it, it um, uh, again, Python is asking TFF to execute a federated computation that represents a single round of federated training. And where, where the state, which includes your model parameters, will get updated with new trained model parameters, and so it will continue. Now, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, uh, TFF gives you flexible deployment options and all those runtimes that you can customize yourself. Um, uh, we won't have time to talk about this today, but the TFF framework namespace contains uh, various components that allow you to uh, create runtimes that you can uh, you know, uh, host on GCP, or you can even integrate your own uh, custom backend systems into TFF and run uh, computations there. Um, if you're interested in exploring this, please reach out to us um, and uh, be more than happy to, to follow up and help you. Uh, but meanwhile, meanwhile, this is all I have. Um, so um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the day, all the tutorials, and thank you very much. And now let me introduce uh, Emilia Nova, who will be presenting the first of the tutorials. 
Awesome. Uh, thanks, Chris. And thanks, everyone, for joining us for the introduction to TFF tutorial. Um, if you're following along at home, first we have to do some setup steps before we jump in. So let's go ahead and make sure that we're connected to a hosted runtime. And then we're going to make sure that we have the, crop, the proper um, PIP packages installed for TensorFlow Federated and the other libraries that we'll need throughout this tutorial. We can go ahead and run this cell to make sure that everything's been set up correctly. You should see a greeting um, if this is all set up correctly. So today I'm going to be running through a variant of the Federated Learning for Image Classification tutorial. Um, those concepts that Peter and Chris just introduced, um, we'll be diving into here and playing around with the TFF Learning API um, with having fun with the classic MNIST uh, training example. Uh, so throughout this tutorial, uh, here's the sections that we'll cover. Um, we've already loaded those TFF libraries. Then we're going to start where every fun machine learning process starts, um, exploring and analyzing and pre-processing the data that we have available to us. We'll uh, create a model. If you're familiar with Keras, this section will look um, pretty familiar to you. Then we'll go ahead and set up a federated averaging process for training. We'll analyze those metrics and try to understand what those metrics actually mean. We'll build a federated evaluation computation to evaluate the model that we produced as a result of federated training. And then we'll go ahead and analyze our evaluation metrics. Awesome, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, we're going to uh, look at our data. Uh, with federated learning, we require a federated data set so this is a collection of data from multiple users. Federated data is typically non-IID. Um, users will typically have different distributions of data depending on usage patterns. Uh, one thing that's really cool with TFF is we've seeded the repository with a few federated data sets, um, including the one that we're going to use today, which is a federated version of the MNIST data set that contains a version of the original NIST data set that's been reprocessed using LEAF um, so that the data is keyed by the original writer of the digits. Um, because every writer has their own unique style, this data set will exhibit the kind of like non-IID um, behavior that we'd expect from a federated data set, or that's pretty typical of a federated data set. So one thing that I like to call out in a production federated environment, um, it'd be more challenging to work with federated data because you don't have access to the data itself so you wouldn't be able to do the analysis that we're about to do in this following section. Um, because we are working in a simulation environment, we have all the data available to us locally um, so we can uh, go ahead and explore it. So let's go ahead and see how we can load um, our sample data set. Um, we're going to load the train data set and the test data set. Um, we can load it from the TFF repository again. Here's where all the data sets are. We're going to select the MNIST data set and we'll use the load data function. So if we go ahead and run that cell, we can download all of our data. Um, this data that was returned by the load data method is um, an instance of the TFF simulation da client data interface. Um, this allows us to enumerate a set of users um, to construct a TF data set that is actually a representation of like a single user's data. Um, so keep in mind that this interface allows us to, um, it will allow us to inter iterate over client IDs, but this is only um, a feature of the simulation data. Um, as you can, as we'll see shortly, the client identities are not used by the federated learning framework itself. Their only purpose here is to allow us to select a subset of the data. So let's see how we can explore this data set. Um, if we get the length of our training data set, we can see we have like around 3,000 clients. Um, we can explore the shape of our data by selecting um, one of the client's data sets and looking at the element spec. Um, and here we see that it's what we would expect of an MNIST data set um, data entry. We have the label that the image maps to. Um, and then we have our pixels of our image um, in a 28 by 28 image. 
So let's go ahead and select an example data set from one of our simulated clients again. And then we can um, explore this data set further by getting an example element. Um, so if you're familiar with TF data sets, this should look pretty familiar to you. Um, so here we've got an example element by creating an iterator. And let's go ahead and look at the label of the element we've selected just because I'm curious. Uh, let's see what number we actually got from our first client. And it looks like we've selected um, a five. And let's go ahead and plot the actual pixels of that five. And we can see this is kind of like what the shape of the training data uh, looks like. Um, so this next section, we're going to explore like the non-IID behavior of uh, the federated data. Uh, use this time to ask any questions on the Dory if you have any questions or get caught up. Um, so let's first look at um, a selection of the MNIST digits from one client. Uh, so you can see here, um, because it's been keyed by uh, one user, this is one user who um, just wrote out all of the MNIST digits and here's a nice little sampling of 40 of those. And we can go ahead and look at the number of examples um, that each client has for each label for the MNIST data set. Uh, so this kind of gives us an idea that uh, on each client, they have a different, different distribution of the MNIST digits available to them. Um, some clients have less data, some clients have like fewer examples for each uh, label. We can see client two has fewer examples than say for instance, client zero or client one. Um, beyond that, the clients actually have um, exhibit different um, training examples themselves. So if we run this cell, um, we'll be plotting a mean image of what each client has available to them. So if we look at this, for example, um, we can see that client two or client zero on average draws their twos like this. So when we go ahead and perform that local training step, um, client zero will be teaching the model that twos look like this. Whereas client um, two draws their twos much bigger um, a little bit less neat than client zero, and they'll be nudging the model in a slightly different direction as to what a two is. Um, so that's kind of neat to see how each local training process um, trains on each of these clients' data locally, and we'll see later how we can combine all these updates into the global model. Awesome, so now let's actually pre-process this data. Since this data is already available to us as a TF data set, um, pre-processing can be accomplished using um, the typical data set transformations that you're used to. Um, I've provided a link there to that actually links to those um, transformations if you want more information. Uh, here, we're going to be flattening our 28 by 28 images into um, a 784 um, element array. We'll be shuffling the individual examples We'll be organizing them into batches. Uh, and we're renaming the features um, from pixels and label to X and Y uh, so that it works with Keras. And then we've also thrown in a repeat so that we can run over um, multiple epochs with the data. So let's go ahead and run that cell to build our pre-processing function. And we can verify that worked by applying the pre-processing to our, one of our example data sets and getting a sample batch from that. So you can see here that um, our images are now those flattened rays and we still have our labels associated with them and we've renamed our data. Um, cool. Uh, so given that this is a TFF simulation, how do we actually feed this data into the TFF simulation? Uh, one way that we can do this is to feed the federated data to TFF through a list of TF data sets, where each element in that list corresponds to one simulated client's data. Um, because this is simulation, again, we have all the data available to us locally. So we can create a simple helper function here that will construct this list of data sets for use with a TFF simulation. So here we can uh, run our helper function that will pre-process each client data set and then return that as a list. Um, now the next important part for federated um, training and federated evaluation, uh, choosing our clients. So in a typical federated training scenario, we're dealing with potentially a very large population of 
user devices, uh, where only a fraction of those devices would be available for training at a given point. In this case, so this is the case, for example, for mobile phones that would only participate in training when they're plugged in, when they're idle, when they're off a metered network. Um, of course, since we are in a simulated environment, all of our data is available to us locally. So when running a simulation here, we would typically sample a random subset of clients each round um, so that they would be different each round. That being said, here we're only going to sample the clients once because this is a tutorial and we want to encourage a faster convergence rate here. Um, in the next tutorial, Nova will show you how to um, simulate random sampling for each round. So here we're just grabbing the first 10 clients from our trained data set. And then um, let's go ahead and create, let's go ahead and get the data into the proper form for consumption by our TFF simulation. So we're just going to be calling our helper function that make federated data function. We'll be passing it our training data set. And um, we want the, these clients to participate. So if we go ahead and run this, um, federated data, train data, there it is. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that we've selected 10 of our clients and the um, data sets have been pre-processed into the way that we just um, defined. Awesome, so let's uh, create a model now with Keras that we'll be using for federated uh, training and federated evaluation. If you're already familiar with Keras, this should look pretty familiar with you. Um, one really nifty thing about the TFF Learning API is you can just take a Keras model that you already have defined for centralized training or that you've used in other applications and you can just plug it into this framework for um, federated, and it will construct a federated training or a federated evaluation computation for you. Um, so let's go ahead and create our Keras model. You can see we have like our input layer, um, we have one dense layer, and then we have our softmax that will get us our prediction for image classification. Uh, let's take a brief look at what um, a centralized training API looks like with Keras. Uh, use this time again um, to ask any questions on the Dory to get caught up. This, this section is a great time to do that. So let's uh, look at what a centralized training looks like with Keras. Um, Keras again has an MNIST data set uh, similar to like how we have, or how TensorFlow Federated has the eMNIST data set. They have an MNIST data set. Um, we're gonna select our training and test data sets from here. We're going to similarly pre-process this data, reshaping it, um, making sure it's like a float 32s. Uh, we're going to use the same model that we'll be using for federated training. Here's how you attach an optimizer loss and metrics in the centralized setting. And let's go ahead and run um, two epochs over the training data for centralized data, just to kind of get a feel for how that API works. Awesome, so now that we've done centralized training, let's, let's see what this looks like um, with uh, TFF. So in order to use a, a model with TFF, it has to be wrapped um, as a tff.learning.model, which will expose um, methods to stamp the model's forward pass, metadata properties, et cetera. And it will also provide ways of like controlling the process of computing a federated metric. Um, let's not really worry too much now about the model API. Uh, if you have a Keras model, like I've uh, told you, or I've, I went over before, um, you can just have TFF wrap this by invoking our function here, the tff.learning.fromCaris model. You'll pass in the model that you create here and a sample bat or and an input spec to kind of give TFF an idea of what um, the data looks like that you'll be consuming. You can go ahead and attach your loss here and add any metrics that you'd like to see. So let's create our model uh, creator function. And now the part that we're all waiting for, let's see what um, federated training looks like in TFF. So now that we have our model wrapped as a TFF learning model for use with TFF, we can let TFF construct our federated averaging algorithm that you learned about from Peter earlier, Peter and Chris earlier. Uh, keep in mind that the argument here uh, is actually a constructor function. It's not the actual model itself. Um, this is so that TFF can construct our model in different contexts that it controls. 
And another critical note here is that for the federated averaging algorithm, you actually need two optimizers, both a client optimizer and a server optimizer. The client optimizer is only used to compute local model updates on each client. The server optimizer will apply that average update to the global model at the server. So in particular, that means that the choice of optimizer and learning rates may be different from the ones that you would use on a standard IID data set. So we recommend um, starting with regular SGD and maybe choosing a smaller learning rate than usual. Uh, if all of this is super interesting to you, stick around for Zach's tutorial um, where he'll be diving more into depth there. So here's our iterative process. We're using the Learning API's build federated averaging process, passing in our model function that is wrapping our Keras model um, for use with TFF. Here's our client optimizer. And let's go ahead and define our own server optimizer function. Um, let's see. We'll be using a Keras optimizer. Um, and here, let's see, what should our learning rate be? Let's just go ahead and choose one here. Awesome. Let's go ahead and construct our iterative process. So what just happened here? Um, Chris kind of gave us a brief overview of what an iterative process is, but I'll just go ahead and cover that again here. Um, an iterative process has two um, computations, the initialize function and the next function. Um, you can think of an iterative process as being driven by a control loop like this. Um, we have our initialize function creating our initial server state. Um, and then we can use that initial server state in a for loop like this to run multiple training rounds um, via our next function. We'll get more into that um, in a little bit. So first, let's go ahead and invoke our initialize computation to construct that initial server state. Um, our server state contains things like the initial state of our model and the initial state of the optimizers. Our second in the pair of federated computations is our next method, which represents a single round of our federated averaging process. Um, this consists of pushing that server state, um, including those model parameters, the optimizer state, to the clients, or besides the optimizer state, the, the model parameters to the clients. Um, they'll perform on-device training using their own local data. Um, this includes collecting and averaging those model updates back together to pr produce a newly updated model back at the server that's learned from all of those uh, clients' different usage patterns. So let's see what running a single round looks like here. And uh, let's go ahead and like visualize those results. Um, so here's running a single round of federated training. We're using our iterative process and calling our next function. And we see that for round one, we've produced an accuracy of this much and a loss of that much. That's pretty cool. So let's go ahead and run several more rounds. Uh, here's what the control loop looks like here. Um, we're going to run 11 more rounds. Uh, again, for the sake of demonstration, we're going to reuse the same clients um, from earlier just to like encourage a faster convergence. Um, in Nova's tutorial, you will see how to actually select different data for each round. So cool, we see that our accuracy is going up like you always want to see, and the loss is going down. Uh, nifty. Uh, later on in evaluation, we'll see some important caveats to what these training metrics actually mean. Um, but for now, just see that they're an indication that training is happening. Um, because just printing our output here isn't as visually stunning as like a nice little nifty plot, Let's uh, re run through our control loop again and see how we can introduce TensorBoard into the mix so that we can visualize our metrics in a cleaner way. So if you're familiar with TensorBoard, this part should look pretty familiar to you. We're going to be creating our summary writer here. That create file writer. We'll be passing it that temporary logger I just created. And so again, we're creating our initial server state. And then within our control loop here, we're actually um, passing those metrics to uh, this TF summary scaler, and they're getting written out to that log directory um, so that uh, we can use TensorBoard to go ahead and visualize our metrics. Um, so while that's running, um, let me go ahead and start up our TensorBoard instance. 
uh, this instance will allow us to view the metrics that we just produced as a result of federated training. And here we can see our loss is going down again. And we can see our accuracy is climbing up, which is pretty nifty. Awesome. So in order to view your evaluation metrics the same way, you would add that to the evaluation um, metric computation. Awesome. So how is our training model actually performing? So in all of our experiments, we've only presented federated training metrics. And these represent the average metrics over batches of data trained across all clients for the round. This will introduce the normal concerns about overfitting, um, especially since we use the same set of clients for each round for simplicity. Um, but then there's also this additional notion of overfitting and training metrics specific to the federated averaging algorithm. The easiest way to understand this type of overfitting is to imagine each client only has a single batch of data and we train on that batch for many iterations, like multiple epochs. In this case, the local model will quickly exactly fit to that one batch of data and the local accuracy reported for that training round for that um, client will approach one. So that this can be shown to say that the training metrics can only be taken as a sign that training is progressing, but not really the actual performance of your model. To understand how your model is performing, um, one way we can do this is using federated evaluation. Uh, Nova will show you how to do centralized evaluation of your model. So here we can go ahead and construct our, our federated evaluation um, computation. So let's call this evaluation. Um, we're going to be using the learning API again, and it has this nifty build federated evaluation uh, function. And we can go ahead and supply it our model constructor again. So we're using our same Keras model, but this time we're constructing a, a federated evaluation computation. So let's go ahead and run that. And now let's uh, prepare our test status set again. We're going to be selecting a different subset of clients to perform evaluation on. Um, we're using our same helper function to get it into that same format that we need to feed it into a TFF simulation. Um, and let's go ahead and see what that looks like. Um, again, we selected 10 clients and we've pre-processed their data sets to be in the form that we uh, want to consume. So let's go ahead and run um, an evaluation. So we're going to be getting test metrics back. We can use that evaluation federated computation we just had. We'll be using this model that we produced as a result of federated training. So this will represent the last, um, the updated model from all those rounds of training. And we'll be using our federated test data here. So Thesia is just running the cell and we can go ahead and look at our test metrics from that. And we can see that this is uh, this gives us a better idea of how our model is actually performing. Here's our accuracy here and our loss here. So this is going to go ahead and conclude this tutorial. Um, we encourage you if the, all of this is interesting to play around with those hyperparameters, play around with other parameters like batch size, number of users, epochs, learning rate, et cetera. Um, to modify the code above to um, improve the, the accuracy that we're seeing here and the, the loss that we're seeing here. Um, before I switch off to Nova, let's go ahead and go to the Dory to see if there's any questions. Cool. So it looks like the CoLab notebooks are a bit different. Um, I believe we'll be uh, supplying these tutorials um, to you. If you go to the TensorFlow Federated website, you'll see um, some tutorials that you can run through um, again if you are having trouble with the notebook here. Uh, is transformation a part of the iterative process on each device needs to run transformation outside of the TF graph? Um, so I think this is referring to data set transformations. And because TFF only works in simulation right now, we can go ahead and pre-process that data before running training. Um, so this actually occurs before the iterative process part. Um, 
You mentioned we need two optimizers, one for the server and one for the client. Is the client optimizer shared among all the clients or a separate optimizer for each client? Also, I would like to know when averaging the weights on the server, what operations should be done on the optimizers? Um, so here, um, the client optimizer, it's each client will receive a copy of um, a different client uh, optimizer. Uh, they have, yeah, essentially they have a separate optimizer for each client. Um, I would also like to know when averaging the weights on the server, what operations should be done on the optimizers. Um, I don't un think I understand this question fully. Um, you can think of averaging the weights back on the server as completing that federated averaging um, process where you are taking all the updates that you have received from each of the clients and um, averaging back that all of that back together. Um, and I just received um, a note from one of my fellow presenters to um, remind you that on that website where you got links to the collabs, um, the user copy is incomplete and the full copy will have everything that you saw today filled in. Awesome. So how could you deal with different pre-processing coming from clients which have different devices? So here we're thinking about hospitals which could send different IRM in images from different device models example. Um, so that's a really great question. Maybe in your pre-processing step, you can see um, data that is in different forms and you can apply different transformations to um, the example. So you can like see what type the example is and you can um, apply the transformation that you want depending on um, that. But here again to note, this is a simulation environment. So all the data is available to you locally. Um, is federated averaging algorithm customizable and what are the levels levers we have? Um, sorry, I haven't read too much on it yet. Um, so this is actually a really great question and I'll refer you to Zach's tutorial uh, later. Um, I know that's not much of an answer now, but it's foreshadowing what you'll see later on um, in this tutorial series. Um, sorry if I'm jumping ahead, but is the data slash model updates encrypted? Um, this is a really awesome question with uh, federated learning and it, it, it shows that there's, um, this is actually a really important question for like uh, user privacy in this case. And yes, uh, there's different techniques you can do to make these model updates private and uh, ensure that the data is private on each device. There's things like secure aggregation, there's things like differential privacy, et cetera. Um, I'd refer you more to, I believe um, TensorFlow Federated, the website has more about this. Um, what's the roadmap for non-simulation uh, device data as that's where production apps will begin to make an impact? This is a really great question. Um, stay tuned for more. Uh, you can check in on the TensorFlow Federated website. Should we standardize the data like location scale transformation and how does that work? Um, again, the data pre-processing step is all in your hands. Um, you can go ahead and play around with this in simulation and see what works for you in that regard. Um, we offer these libraries to allow you to kind of test it out as well. Um, I'm not sure what time I'm getting, if I should pass this off to Nova yet. Um, maybe we have time for one more question. Another topic of interest, users at the edge that subjectively label data in contradicting ways, any way to detect that and potentially split the clients into groups that collaborate together versus groups that are canceling out each other's work. Um, so in this case, remember that in a real federated production environment, you wouldn't have access to the user's data. Um, so you wouldn't really be able to know that this is happening. Um, you can do different like FA and that kind of stuff to see the different qualities of your data itself. Um, but like in this case, um, I think that there could be different ways of doing data set pre-processing. Awesome. Um, thanks for everyone for tuning in for this image classification tutorial. Uh, let me go ahead and pass it off to Nova. Uh, she'll be presenting um, text generation uh, TFF tutorial. Hi, everyone. 
Um, thank you so much, Emily, for introducing TFF. Um, and so in this tutorial, we'll expand on what Emily showed you by applying federated learning to a different problem. So we'll try doing text generation. Um, one thing to note is that you will be continuing on with the same Colab notebook. Um, so if you already are connected, then you won't have to run these steps. But if you had a problem, um, you will have to make sure to do the same beginning steps where you um, upgrade TensorFlow Federated and then make sure TFF works by running this next cell to run the greeting. Um, so with this tutorial, we'll be learning a few new things about TFF. Um, sorry for the scrolling. So in addition to trying a new um, application of federated learning, we'll also be interspersing centralized training and federated training. So this is actually a very useful thing because you might have a model that is already trained and you want to refine it using federated training so that you can get the model to match the data that's at the edge rather than centralized data that you use to initially train it. Um, and then you might also want to intersperse federated training and centralized evaluation in case you have a held out test data set um, that you have centralized. And so we'll show you how to do that as well. And then finally, we'll also show if you have your own data um, in this example, we'll show loading it from a CSV file and you want to use it with TFF, we'll show you how to do that. Okay, so in this tutorial, we will load a model that was trained um, on centralized data. So in this case, it was trained on Charles Dickens data. Um, and what we wanna do is fine tune the model with Shakespeare data. Um, so we can take a look at what the model generates right now. And so the text that this generates will look a lot more like a Charles Dickens novel than a Shakespeare um, novel uh, or play. Um, so now what we'll do is we'll load a Shakespeare data set from the TFF repo. Um, so this is available for anyone to load. Um, and, but what we might wanna do in a different case is you might have your own data um, and you might want to use that with TFF. So what we'll do in this tutorial is we'll show that you can load your own CSV file into TFF. So in order to demonstrate that, we can write the data from the Shakespeare data set out to a CSV file and download it and then try re-uploading it again. So first we'll write this data out to CSV. And while we're doing this, we can think, we can learn a bit about what the data set looks like. So in this data set, each um, client is a Shakespeare character. So let's print and see what it looks like as a CSV. So in the CSV file, we have two columns, character and snippets. Character indicates one character from a Shakespeare play. And then snippet, uh, that is a line that that character spoke. So in this case, we have Adam from All's Well That Ends Well, and then some lines that Adam spoke. And one way we can think about this is that each of the characters is typing out their lines on their phone. So Adam is typing out, yonder comes my master, your brother, on his phone. And then we want to train our model to learn from these lines that these characters are typing. OK, so now in order to um, get the data on our computer so we can show how we would actually upload it, we can download these uh, CSV files that we just created. One thing to note is that if you're following along, make sure you allow Colab to download multiple files. And so now we'll re-upload the files, so choose them from your computer. So while we're uploading these files, we can talk about how we're going to actually load these into a TFF data set. So what we need to do is um, we're going to call this function um, TFF simulation client data from client and function. And then we need to provide two things. So the first thing we need to provide is client IDs. 
And the way we get these client IDs is first we're going to read our CSV file and we're doing this using pandas and you don't have to use pandas, um, but it's just a convenient way to read the CSV and then process the data. Um, so first we read the file and then we collect all the unique character names from the character column because these are going to be our client IDs. And so that's what we provide to this first parameter, client IDs. And then the next thing we have to do is provide the create, data, create TF dataset for client function. And so what this is, is a function that maps from a single client ID to a TensorFlow dataset for that client. So the way we get this is given a client ID, we look in our pandas data frame and retrieve only the rows that correspond to this client ID. And remember a client ID in this case is a Shakespeare character. And then we're going to filter out any rows that don't have any snippet. Um, then we're going to select just the data columns. So in our TensorFlow data set, we don't want the client ID column. Um, and one thing to note here is that in this data set, we only have a single data column, the snippets column. But in your data set, you might have multiple data columns. So maybe um, multiple features and then a label. And you can extend this approach to work for a data set that has multiple columns. So we'll just have to make a few modifications to this code. Then we'll convert our pandas data frame into a dictionary in the format where the column name is the key and the column uh, contents are the value. And then we can use a generator um, that yields each row of this list of dictionaries. And then we can call the TensorFlow dataset from generator function and then um, provide this generator. And one thing we have to do here is we have to explicitly specify the output types and the output shapes because they are not tensors um, and TensorFlow expects them to be tensors. If they're not, in this case, we have maps, then we need to explicitly uh, specify what the output types and output shapes are. So let's see if this works. We'll try actually calling this on our CSV files. And then if this works, then we'll be able to look at the data set for a particular client. So in this case, we'll look at the king from King Lear. And then we can see a couple of his examples. So um, we can see what the data looks like. In this case, it looks like a snippet. Um, a snippet is the key for our dictionary. And then the value is a string tensor, which is a line that King Lear spoke. Um, so if for any reason you are trying to follow along and you weren't able to follow along with the steps to load from CSV, don't worry about it. And you can just reload the original data sets right here using this cell. But if it did work for you and you were able to see the snippets for King Lear, then you can just continue following along. Um, and one thing to note is if you are trying to use the user copy and you're having trouble typing along, you can always refer to the full copy instead. So in this section, we're going to talk a bit about pre-processing the data. So there's no new TFF concepts in this particular section. If you want to take a break to ask a question on the Dory, for example. Um, but we do need to, um, we'll need this code that we're writing to be able to run the next section. So if you do take a break, just make sure you run all these cells before coming back and trying to run the next cell. So, um, what we'll do is just use some TensorFlow dataset transformations to prepare our data for training. And so the first thing we want to do is we will map our string snippets to tensors of integers, where the integers each represent the index of the character in our vocabulary, which we defined above. And then the other prepressing steps are we'll want to first map the characters to IDs as we discussed. Then we want to split them into individual, split these um, snippets into individual characters and then form um, sequences of sequence length plus one. So we want to have a consistent sequence length here. 
So we batch it into these sequences of consistent length, which is 100. And then we will shuffle, shuffle and then form mini batches. And finally, we want to split these sequences into an input and a target. The input has the first n, or where n is sequence length characters, and then the target has the last n where n is sequence length characters. And the reason we want to do that is because given characters zero through n, we want to be able to predict character n plus one. So another thing to note is that if you have trouble following along with any of these steps related to the model itself. Um, all this is based off of a TensorFlow tutorial about text generation. And so you can refer to that tutorial if you want to dive deeper into the details of the model. And it's linked to in this collab. Um, but I'm not talking too deeply about this because we want to get to the section that's specific to TFF. OK, so let's see if we pre-process our example data set that we made earlier, what are the types? So we have a tuple of tensors. Um, remember, the tuple is because we have the input and the target. And each of them are shape 8, 100. 8 is the batch size, and 100 is the sequence length. Cool. Um, so one and the additional thing we are going to do is define a new metric. So we want to count char character level accuracy. So this would be the fraction of predictions where the highest pr probability is actually put on the correct next character. Um, and we are defining it as a new class rather than just calling Keras sparse categorical accuracy because we need to flatten our vector from rank three to rank two. Um, the rank three is because we have batch size times sequence length um, times vocabulary size. So finally, we can compile a Keras model um, and then evaluate it on our example data set. So what you'll see is we'll be evaluating our model, which was trained on the Charles Dickens data on Shakespeare, but it still performs much better than random guessing. So this evaluating on completely random data, that's when we just generate a sequence of random characters and then evaluate on that. Um, and as we expect, it performs close to the expected accuracy for random guessing. But evaluating on Shakespeare data um, performs much better than that. So we're already, we already have an advantage, but we still want to be able to tune the model to really fit the distribution of the Shakespeare data. Awesome. So now we'll start talking more about TFF. So if you were taking a break to ask a question or anything like that, this would be a great time to make sure to come back, run the previous cells so you're caught up, and then we can um, continue and talk more about TFF. So Emily mentioned in her tutorial, but we need to provide this function, create TFF model, and anything any models that we create need to be created within this function um, because they need to be serialized so that they can run in a potentially non-Python environment. So in Emily's tutorial, um, she'd find the entire model within this function. But in this tutorial, we already have a model. So what we need to do is just clone the model. And then we can provide that to this TFF learning from Keras model function. Um, so first, the Keras model clone. Um, the next thing we'll provide is the input spec. So this is the way of telling TFF what our input data looks like. So we can provide this by just um, from our example data set, which is a TFF data set, we can get this element spec. And this is just a description for TFF of what it should expect for the input data. Um, and then the next thing is we just provide the loss. And this is just the same as the loss that we provided when we created the carrots model above. Um, 
Ah, I forgot losses. And then from logits equals true because we're predicting um, probabilities for each of the elements in the vocab. And then we finally provide the metric that we created above in this list of metrics. So um, flattened categorical accuracy. So, so now that we have our function to create the TFF model, we're ready to construct our iterative process. And Emily described a bit more about iterative processes above. Um, so we'll use, again, a federated averaging process. And in this case, we only provided the client optimizer function. That doesn't mean there's no server optimizer. That just means that it is the default. Um, so if you wanted to add a server optimizer function that was different, that would work too. Um, so then what we want to do next is create a function to initialize the state of the federated computation. So first we'll call initialize on our iterative process. Um, but this will only initialize the model to random initializers, not the weights that we have that are pre-trained because clone model doesn't clone the weights. So in order to start the training from a pre-trained model, we actually need to set the model weights um, directly from the Keras model. So now we'll set the state. We'll use the state with new model weights function. So we provide the state that um, our federated computation is using to keep track of all the model parameters. And then we need to provide both trainable weights and non-trainable weights. So our model, um, it might have non-trainable weights, which are part of the model, but we don't want to ever change. So TFF needs to know which parts of our model are trainable and which are non-trainable. So we just need to provide these separately. Um, and then the last thing we need to do is return the state. Let's see. Okay. Cool. So we talked a bit earlier how, as an alternative to federated evaluation, we might want to mix federated training with centralized evaluation if we have some held out test data set um, that we have in a centralized location. So first, to simulate this, we'll create a data set for centralized evaluation by concatenating some of our test data sets um, for evaluation with Keras. And now we can write our function to perform centralized evaluation. So to do this, we'll first um, compile a Keras model um, using the same loss and metrics, and then we need to set our weights from our Keras model onto, or from our TFF model onto the Keras model. So we can use this function, assign weights to Keras model. So we pass in our Keras model as the first parameter. And then our second parameter is our state dot model. So this is the model that TFF has been updating. And then we will compute loss and accuracy by using 
this CARES model to evaluate using our test data set. Awesome. So in Emily's tutorial, we, when we ran federated learning, we just chose the same few clients and use them in every single round of training. And there are a few reasons you might wanna do that. One, in the tutorial setting, Emily did it because it achieves convergence faster to only use the same clients. Um, but you might also be trying to simulate a cross silo federated learning setting, which Peter discussed. And in the cross silo setting, there are a few clients, maybe hospitals is one example, and they're highly available. Um, but if you want to simulate a cross device setting where you're trying to simulate phones, which can only participate in federated learning when they're plugged in on Wi-Fi and idle, then the way you can simulate that is through random sampling. Um, because we're in the simulation environment and the data is locally available, we must use random sampling here. So let's try um, writing our function to get data and use random sampling here. So we can use NumPy. And we take this um, list of clients that pass in, and then we pass in sorry for the bubbles that keep popping up. So we're going to choose three clients each round to um, train on. And then we'll just sample without replacement here. So set replace to false. And so that we can see what clients we're training on each round, let's print. And then we'll return the data for each of these clients. So we had a function above that computes the data. So now that we have our function, um, we can define our training loop. And I'll start the training off now while we discuss it because it'll take a little while. So first we um, have this list of remaining clients, which we'll be using to sample from without replacement. Then we call our init state function, which we defined above, which initializes the model with the weights from uh, centralized training. Now we can iterate um, for 10 rounds of training. And in each round, we will evaluate using the Keras evaluate centralized evaluation function we defined above. And then we can run a round of training using this next function um, on our iterative process. So this actually will um, push the model out to clients, the clients run their updates, and then we will run uh, federated averaging to combine all those client updates. And when we're calling this, we provide the sample clients without replacement function so that we train on different clients each round. And then when we evaluate our function, uh, we'll finally run a round of evaluation at the end to see what our final um, performance of our model ends up being. Cool. So you can see that training has begun. Um, one thing to note, this is something interesting about federated learning that you might have to deal with in a real world setting, is in this case, we had a loss in accuracy of zero. So why might that be? So if you look back closely at our pre-processing function above, if clients did not have sequences that were long enough to um, match sequence length, then their data was dropped. So these are all minor characters from Shakespeare. So they didn't have enough data to even participate um, because they didn't match sequence length. Um, so this can introduce bias in federated learning because there may be 
clients that only have a small amount of data, but you still want to be, if you don't want bias in your model, you want to be able to use that data as well. So one thing that we could do is rather than dropping lines that are not long enough for or characters that don't have enough data to match sequencing, what we could do is add a special token to the end of their sequence to um, get the sequence to sequence length. And then we could modify our loss function to take this special padding token into account. Um, so we just didn't do that in this tutorial in the interest of time, but it could be an interesting extension um, if you want to do that on your own. Cool. So as we can see, the loss is going down over time, evaluation loss. Um, but what you might want to do is experiment with other optimizers. So we just use plain stochastic gradient descent on the clients um, in, the, in the training that we just ran. But we could try adding momentum. Um, and it's very easy to try different optimizers in TFF because all you have to do is provide a different optimizer to these functions, client optimizer function and server optimizer function. Um, so on an NLP data set such as Shakespeare, um, we might want to try an adaptive optimizer such as Adam. So we could, instead of using SGD at all, we could um, provide Adam to the client optimizer. Um, so we could try running this again in the interest of time. Um, I will leave you, if you want to do that on your own, you can run the training with these different optimizers. One thing to note though is Right here, we're only providing um, a different client optimizer. But when you are trying to experiment with optimizers for federated learning, it is important that you also tune the server optimizer at the same time, um, because the client optimizer and server optimizer interact with each other. And um, if you tune just one at a time, you might not end up with the optimal um, learn, uh, learning rates. So um, we only ran 10 rounds of training when we just ran our training loop above. So achieving convergence when we're doing random sampling um, is, it might take much longer than that. So if you wanted to achieve convergence, you might want to run more like hundreds of rounds. Um, and that would take much too long for this interactive tutorial. So. If you did train longer on more Shakespeare data, however, you would see a difference in the style of the generated text. Um, but here we can see that we can uh, try setting our trained weights back into a Keras model that we can then use to generate text. Um, so here we, we have the Keras model already that has the weights from federated training. And the reason it already has those weights is because we use it for evaluation. Um, and then now we use it to generate checks. So right now this still looks more like Charles Dickens, I would say, um, but if you were to run more rounds of iterative training, you should see it looking much more like Shakespeare. Great, okay, I think we can go ahead and take some questions now. Okay. How do we specify client ID, like IP or URL, where the client is running or client data is present? In notebooks, we only have a simulation and we have data also on the same machine. So we're not computing, communicating with some remote machine. So how to take the understanding from these notebooks to production? Yeah, I think this is a good question. So in this tutorial, we were able to select a particular client ID and look at the data and something that you should know is that in production, you wouldn't be able to do this. So the clients are anonymous in production um, and you wouldn't be able to look at their individual data. So the reason we make this possible in simulation is because it can be useful for debugging um, and that's something that you would want to iron out before you would start running a federated learning algorithm in production. <laughs> like the, the concept of Shakespeare characters chatting on phone. Yeah, I think 
that's fun. <laughs> I kind of want to see a picture of that. Um, do we have some examples of how to for perform federated learning in TensorFlow JS? Um, I don't know of anything like that, but if anybody else from the TensorFlow team knows about that, or TensorFlow federated team knows, uh, feel free to chime in. Um, hi, this is Keith. Uh, I think we do not. Architecturally, it could be supported, but it's not something that we've really pushed on. Um, cool. How do the local and server optimizers interact? Um, so this is getting a lot more into the research territory. So there's actually some recent papers. Zach Charles just um, put out a paper on Archive about the way that the local optimizers and server optimizers interact to not only achieve um, faster convergence, but sometimes achieve where the model ends up converging. So there's a lot of things to unpack here, so I don't know that I can quickly answer it, but there's a lot of interesting papers out there that you can read about. Yes. I guess simulation is used to create data shards locally, but that's not the case for distributed data. Will the package change to access data remotely? Um, so yeah, so right now, we can do simulation using TFF. Um, if we, in the future, support a production deployment, then TFF as a library would look the same, but um, because the TFF has been designed so that um, it will work um, as a language and the way you use it would be the same if we were to support actually running on clients. Um, however, we don't support that right now. In a production environment, how does the server determine which clients to accept? So this depends a lot on the clients themselves. So first of all, as we mentioned, the clients have to be plugged in, um, idle, and on Wi-Fi or an unmetered network. And then the clients will check into the server. Um, and then the server can optimize at what point the clients check in by then providing clients a window in which to return. So that way, the server can control the rate at which clients are checking in um, and ensure that it doesn't get overloaded. And at the same time, also ensure that if it has a small number of clients, then enough clients can check in at once in order to actually run a round of training and have enough clients rendezvous. When can we expect a production deployable version of TFF? Um, I can't give you any information on this. I don't know if anybody from the TFF team wants to address this. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't think I can either. <laughs> I don't know that anybody can. Um, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> It'd be interesting to know in practice how the cross-device training would work. I'm thinking if devices are likely idle at night, then do you batch training across time zones, for example? Yeah, this is a really good question um, because it's very true that devices are idle at night because people plug in their phones while they're sleeping. Um, and so one thing this can introduce is actually um, bias because certain rounds of training will use data that is um, from a, a similar time zone. Um, so even if you don't try to batch the training across time zones, that ends up happening just by the nature of when clients are checking in. So that might be something that you try to, uh, when you're, determining how to train your model, this is something you might need to take into account and make sure that you're trying to get a wide spectrum of data from different time zones so that you aren't um, learning on just one time zone and biasing your model. How can you ensure that clients are converging at a good pace? Because you would always be working on simulated data is there are such metrics published from clients? Um, so I think 
in this case, you can use the training loss and training metrics. Um, yeah, because clients do publish metrics. It's um, whatever metric that you define in your TFF model, um, which we showed we provided the flattened categorical accuracy metric, but you could provide other metrics as well. And then these metrics are averaged on the server. So then what you see is the average of the training loss from all the clients um, or the average of whatever other metrics. Um, so yeah, I think that would be the way you can ensure clients are converging. So can you elaborate on training server and client optimizer together? So all I mean here is that if you tune the client optimizer by itself, um, and then you pick a particular learning rate, and then you tune the server optimizer later um, and pick learning rate for that, then that those two learning rates you end up picking would not necessarily be optimal as if you were to try the, uh, the combinations of different server and client learning rates. Could you dive a little deeper into the relationship between client and server optimizers? Um, yeah, I think there's been a couple of questions about this, but maybe uh, Zach Charles might have more information in his tutorial about this, or um, he might want to jump in with rules. Yeah, of yeah, I can jump in. Um, so that we've uh, posted a lot of links to some maybe some papers that discuss it, uh, but I, I, I think in general, what you want to think of is that the client optimizer works a little like it does in centralized learning. It actually learns from data on the device. The server optimizer does something a little bit different. It takes all the client updates, it averages them, and it, then it treats this as kind of a pseudo gradient um, for some overall loss function at a very, very high level. Um, and there's a lot that you can explore for how to set the client learning rate and how to set the server learning rate. I can't discuss it all right now. Uh, I'd encourage you to check out a paper we put out called Adaptive Federated Optimization. It discusses this problem in much more detail. Um, and if you check out some of the comments on Dory, I've posted a link to the paper. Thanks, Zach. Are all clients required to use the same type of optimizer? Um, yeah, I believe this is true. You would use the same optimizer over all clients. If anyone knows of a way to use different optimizers, you could jump in, but I, I'm pretty sure you have to use the same for all clients. So download the notebooks. I see. Yeah, so for um, future tutorials, make sure that you just use the notebook in Colab um, online. So you shouldn't have to download the Colabs at all. You can just um, run them in the cloud using Colab. So just make a copy of the Colabs that we provided. Um, and then in your own copy, you connect to a runtime and you can follow along there without having to download it. Are the client computations parallelized across clients in different threads? If not, is there a way to parallelize the client computations? And is there a maximum number of clients that we can parallelize? I think this might be a better question for someone on the TFF team. Wait, sorry, could we, could we repeat it? I was spaced yeah. out for a sec there. <laughs> Are the client computations parallelized across clients in different threads? And is there a maximum client number of clients that we can parallelize? Uh, yes, they are parallelized in different threads. The TFF, um, like executor architecture, you can roughly think of as spinning up a thread to represent each client. If you're running everything locally, you can also run everything in a distributed manner, which, you know, will pin a bunch of clients on a bunch of distributed machines. Um, there actually currently is, uh, such a limit. So we'll start running serially eventually. Um, we're, you know, that's a bit of an implementation detail. I think you should probably think of them as running serially each on its own thread, or concurrently, sorry, each on its own thread. Cool. 
Any pointers to recent work related to device selection for federated learning? Um, I'm, I don't know anything off the top of my head related to device selection in particular. Um, I know that in the systems paper that was published a few years ago, it briefly touches on the problem of device selection and in particular pace steering, which is the way the server tells the clients when to come back. Um, but I don't know about any work that particularly addresses this more recently, but somebody else might. In a real world setting, how would you tokenize words on devices and make sure device vocabs are the same across devices? Um, so this is a good question. So in a real world setting, there is some pre-processing that would be run on each device before you would begin the actual training. So the clients would um, have some instructions on um, exactly how to pre-process their data and they would be doing that before actually training the model with this data. Um, yeah, I think that's. What other wrappers other than Keras are available? Um, well, you can use TensorFlow directly. And what do you plan to support in the near future? So maybe somebody on the TFF team could address this. Uh, yeah, so you, you definitely can use pure TF and just implement your forward pass like straight up normal TensorFlow. I think we don't currently have a plan to support other high level TF APIs. Um, but I, I put a comment on that question. We, you know, we are open source. We definitely would accept contributions for other ones if you wanted to contribute them, but I don't think anybody internally is, is working on it. I don't know if Zach has another idea. Zach G, who I just saw, joined. Nope, guess not. Um, so one thing to note is that if you did ask a question on the Dory, especially if you were asking for a link to a paper or something like that, um, you might want to check back at your question because team members are actively responding in text and you might not get a notification for that. So just check back on your question if you're looking for a link, especially. Um, and you might find the information you need answered by a team member. Cool. So all the models from clients needs to be the same type. Um, so yeah, I think that this is saying that we are training the same model in every client and that is true. So part of the training step um, when we are running the next function on the iterative process is the server is broadcasting the model to the clients um, and the clients then all train the model in the same way. Great, so that looks like we're at the bottom of our list of questions. So now I believe we're going to take a quick break and after the break, we'll come back and Wei Kong will present a tutorial about compression in TFF. So we'll reconvene at 11 to hear from, oh, it's going to be 10 minute break. So we'll reconvene at 10.50 to hear from Wei Kong. for coming back to the tutorial. In uh, my part, I will talk about how to use TFF to do some model and update compression in uh, federal learning research. So in this tutorial, we're gonna uh, use uh, EMNIST dataset two to demonstrate how to enable a lossy compression algorithm to reduce communication costs in federal learning algorithms. So we will mostly using uh, tff.learning.build favorite averaging process API, as well as uh, the tensor encoding API, which can help us uh, to do some compression on the models. So let's get started. First, we install uh, the package and 
run this cell and we should be able to see a hello world printout. So that we know the package is uh, successfully installed. All right, all right. So uh, before we jump in, I'd like to uh, give you an overview of this tutorial. So we can take a look at the table of content first to, to see what we're gonna do. So basically we will first uh, prepare the input data and we will gonna define a model, uh, which includes first we define a Keras model and then a TFF model function, which is quite similar to what you see from uh, Emily's tutorial. And then we will uh, build uh, the training and the evaluation process and run it with metrics visualization enabled. And then we will uh, jump uh, to how do you build a compression uh, functionality in this uh, training process. And we will train the model again to see, to compare the difference between uh, algorithms with compression without compression. So let's go to the first step, preparing the input data. So uh, this is basically the same as what we, uh, see from Emily's tutorial. But the difference here is that uh, in the, uh, the model we use in this tutorial is expecting something you know, different from the uh, model used in the Emily's tutorial. So we will uh, expecting a uh, shape like this, 28, 28, 1. So that's why in this batch format function, we have used a different uh, format here. And after we load the data, let's go to the model part. So we define a CNN model. Uh, note that this model is used in the uh, original paper of third origin algorithm. If you're familiar with Keras, then you know that if we do model.summary, we should be able to see the structure. As you can see, it is a count layer followed by a max boolean. And then a count layer, max pooling, and uh, flatten, and two fully connected layers. All right. So with the Keras model, let's try to build a, a TFF model function. So uh, note that in here we uh, we will need a function in, which produces a TFF model instead of just defining. And uh, in addition to that. The function cannot just pre-capture a, uh, a constructed model. It must create the model in the context of the function. The reason behind this is TFF is designed to go to devices and TFF need to control when the resources are allocated and constructed. So here comes our first question. So. Let's build a tff.learn.model. So as we mentioned, we will first need to create a model in the context within this function. And then we return through, I think you're already familiar with this, with uh, tff.learn.fromcars model. You can create a tff learn model. Let's give it the right model and input spec. Uh, in here, we just, we already prepared input spec for you. So you just need to directly pass it in. And uh, in the comments, we suggest you use uh, this uh, cross entropy loss and metrics is the accuracy. All right, think, yeah. So now let's build the training process. So uh, we're using tff.learning.build ferret origin process to build the uh, error process, uh, I think you already know this from Emily's tutorial. If you haven't, this is basically uh, main 
uh, API we're going to use in this tutorial. So we will we'll build the ev evaluation process as well. Okay, now we have data, data set, model, training uh, process, and the evaluation process. What we're going to do next is to build a function which to run the experiment. So in here we have this function. Uh, this don't worry about you know it, it, it is long, but let's uh, go line by line to see what this function does. So first, this function will need a training process, and it can you can uh, specify how many runs you want to run and how many clients you want to sample uh, each run. And this summarizer is used for TensorBoard to visualize the metrics. So as you can see, first we initialize the process in here, and uh, we sample uh, from training set uh, and create the data. We uh, run in this run using mat, uh, make ferry data function and we give it the initial state and the data in this round. And after this round, this dot next function, we will get a new state and the metrics. So this three lines, because we're doing a compression uh, algorithm in this tutorial. So uh, we will be interested to see, you know, how many data transferred from clients to server and how many data transfer from uh, server to client. So with this uh, little uh, utility function here, uh, we will be able to get those informations. Uh, if you're interested in uh, you know, knowing more about this, uh, here is the link to the API docs. So in here, uh, broadcast bits is uh, where, uh, is what the, the, the amount of data transfer from uh, server to clients. Uh, we use broadcasts uh, to, to, to name this process. And uh, we use aggregation to referring to uh, uh, when uh, data transfer from client to server. Then we print out those informations and we do a uh, evaluation run. We sample from uh, test set and make the test set uh, data and run one round of the ferret a favorited evaluation. So uh, in here, uh, note that normally you don't do one evaluation per training because they will slow your uh, training, slow your whole training process. Usually uh, people will do is uh, every uh, maybe 100, 1000 run, they do one round of evaluation. But in here we just do it per run. And after we have the training and uh, uh, evaluation uh, metrics, we use uh, the summary writer to add those to TensorBoard. Let's run this and let's start the TensorBoard here. All right, right now it, it has nothing. It's expected because we haven't started the training. In this cell, let's start training. Uh, as you can see, we create a, a summary writer for TensorBoard, and we uh, call this run experiment function, give it the training process, and we say we're gonna run uh, 10 rounds, and in each round, we will sample 10 clients and give it a summary writer so that uh, the TensorBoard can be populated with the metrics. So as you can see, the there's already some logs uh, printed out. So in, let's, let's focus on the round zero. So in here we can see, uh, this is the accuracy. You can see the accuracy is increasing and the loss is decreasing and the uh, uh, broadcast bits are increasing and the aggregation bits is also increasing. And we also print out the time uh, span for this round. So uh, as you can see, this value is the, the amount 
of the data transfer from client to server and server to client. All right, uh, looks like we already have your runs. So if we go back to TensorBoard, we should be able to see this. So I recommend you uh, set the smoothing to zero and un uncheck this box to just get the original uh, figure. As you can see, this one is the uh, aggregated bits crossed 10 rounds. And we can also see the broadcast bits increasing. And the training loss is decreasing. The accuracy is increasing. We, uh, we also print out the uh, evaluation metrics. So as you can see the test loss is decreasing the uh, test accuracy is kind of increasing. All right, so I think let's, uh, if, you, uh, if you see the uh, tutorial from uh, the image classification one, you should be pretty familiar with, with the previous concept. So, uh, but in here, uh, know that we only run 10 runs just to make sure everything works. But for an interesting experiment, we recommend you running the code for at least 15,000 runs, which could give you a pretty good model with about 98 accuracy. And you, if you keep training the test and the training accuracy will keep increasing. So uh, that comes to the question number two. So uh, if you're interested, try to fine tuning the hyperparameters like client and server learning rate, client epochs, client batch size, and see uh, how, uh, how many communication rounds you, uh, you can get uh, when you get 99% uh, test accuracy. Let's try to you know, uh, converge to that accuracy using as less run as possible. Know that uh, running uh, 15,000 runs on a GPU uh, collab runtime, which is the current collab runtime we are uh, connecting to, could take you less, uh, about less, uh, less than three hours. But if you fine tuning the hyperparameters, you can get even faster convergence rate. All right, let's move on to the compression part. So we will implement in the compression functionality using Tensor Encoding API. So let's uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, what is Tensor Encoding API. So Tensor Encoding API is a, a general TensorFlow tool for invertible, potentially lossy transformations. Uh, for the API we are interested, we list these two. So first is the research uh, surface API where you can define a, either a identity encoder or a uniform quantization encoder. So basically identity encoder just does nothing, uh, but we will cover what is uniform quantization later. So uh, Tensor Encoding API also provides APIs for fairy learning. So for the broadcast process, it defines a uh, tensor encoding dot core dot simple encoder. And for aggregation, it has a uh, tensor encoding dot core dot gather encoders. Uh, you may uh, ask why, you know, uh, we need different uh, encoders for the broadcast and aggregation process. I think that's a good question. I recommend you uh, exploring the tensor encoding API more to find out the answer. All right, so next we move on to uh, how to build a encoder to perform uniform, uh, uniform quantization. So what is uniform quantization? Uh, this is basically a simple rounding process. So in which uh, each tensor value is rounded into the nearest value from a set of quantization levels. So I have a little example here for you to understand this. So suppose we have a uh, n uh, values in this x array and the mean value is x mean and the maximum value is uh, x uh, max. How do we perform a two-bit uniform quantization? First, we will separate 
this uh, range into four parts because uh, four, uh, two to the power of two is four. And suppose if x1 is somewhere here, then after the uniform quantization, x1 will be rounded into the nearest uh, quantization layer, which is this, this one. And after the quantization, uh, uniform quantization, uh, the x, all the uh, elements in x will only have four distinct values. And usually they are integer values. So this is how, this is why you get the value compressed. All right, to implement that, we just simply do uh, tensor encoding dot encoders dot uniform quantization and give, uh, we're going to use uh, eight bits here. So just give it the uh, number eight. So with that, how, how, how do you build an encoder for TFF? How do you build an encoder for further learning? So suppose you are given a tensor with this uh, 10 times 10, this shape, and the data type is float. How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna create an encoder for this tensor? Okay, the answer is quite simple. We just do uh, create a simple encoder using this API as simple encoder and give it the quantization encoder and the specifications of the tensor. And that's it, that's, that's, that's everything you need to do. And uh, for the aggregation process, it's similar. Just uh, simply use this as scalar encoder instead of as simple encoder. All right, now we have encoder for each individual uh, tensors. How, how are we gonna do next? What are we gonna do next? So uh, the first thing we're gonna do is to define two functions the broadcast encoder function, the main encoder function. This main encoder function is for aggregation. But in here, we are just uh, averaging all the uh, updates. So we use main as a name here. So uh, each of this function will create a instance of either a simple encoder or gala encoder to encode a individual uh, variable in the model. So it is important to know that we don't apply a compression method to the entire model in this tutorial. Uh, we, you can do that, but in this example, we just uh, decide to compress each individual uh, variables in the model independently. So uh, in this example, we will apply a uniform quantization with eight bits to every variables with more than 10,000 elements. And for the elements, uh, for the variables with less than uh, 10,000 elements, we will just do nothing. We just apply identity encoder. So here comes to our question three. So uh, let's create this uh, two functions. So as we can see for the broadcast encoder, if the number of elements is larger than this, we will create a uniform quantization encoder. So I will just copy this here. All right, the answer is just in this tutorial. And for the elements which is uh, less or equal to this value, we will just simply do nothing, which is uh, give it a encoders dot encoders dot identity and yeah. All right, so for the I think we need to write this. Let's see. All right. So we will still uh, return a simple encoder, but we will replace it with, uh, we'll replace the actual encoder with the identity encoder. 
So same here for the aggregation encoder. We will do the same thing, but here we will use scatter code instead. So I'm copy pasting code in here just to save some time, but I recommend you uh, try it yourself. All right, so let's do this. All right, so now we have this. What we're gonna do next? So the next step, before we go to the next step, uh, I want to give you a, a, a preview uh, of the error process. So uh, an iterative process can be seen as a composition of the following process. The first is the broadcast process, which uh, send models or whatever you want to send from client, uh, from server to client. And then a client process where you just do something with the model and your client data. And then after you've done this, uh, we will send whatever you, you have and back to a uh, server. And uh, after that, a server will aggregate those uh, updates and uh, do whatever it, it wants to update the server model. So, uh, but uh, in this uh, compression uh, tutorial, what we will change is only you know two of these four process which is the broadcast process and aggregation process, because we're gonna compress before a broadcast and uh, uh, aggregate before, uh, 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 compress before aggregation, right? So can we still do that using the uh, TFF.learning API? Uh, the answer is yes. So if you use this tff.learning.framework.build encoded broadcast process from model, and give it the model function and the uh, encoder function we just defined. You can create a broadcast process and the aggregation process from here. And, and then, you know, the, the very, uh, you know, good API is that uh, you just simply pass this two process into this high level tff.learning.build uh, fair origin process. And then you will get a iterative process with compression because the broadcast and aggregation process is replaced by a process with compression. Let's run this too. It, it is very simple and convenient, uh, uh, convenient, right? All right. Let's train the model again to see the difference. All right, here comes the question four. We were gonna train the model using the function we just defined like uh, 10 minutes ago. So we will do run experiment and give it a federated averaging process with compression. And we will run 10 runs this time as well. And each round will sample 10 clients and we will be using a different uh, summary writer just to uh, adjust for compression so that we can have uh, two different uh, curves in the uh, tensor board. So let's run this. Hopefully it runs. All right, I think it is running. Good, good, good. I don't need to like debugging anything. That's good. So uh, as you can see, the uh, log are similar. You know, accuracy is increasing, loss is decreasing. We have the uh, forecast base and the aggregated bits available as well. But this time you will see this, uh, this number is you know, a lot less than what we have previously. So if we navigate back to the tensor board, 
cell, which is here. All right. So uh, this this uh, orange line is still here, but we got a new uh, blue line here, uh, which is the uh, curve uh, for the uh, error process with the compression enabled. As you can see, the uh, aggregation bits is you know there's a, a significantly drop in here, as well as the uh, broadcast bits. But we uh, see, you know, similar uh, trends in the loss and accuracy, uh, which means uh, we enable the compression algorithm, but we don't sacrifice the, the loss and the accuracy in this case. You can see the test loss is also decreasing, test accuracy is also, uh, is also increasing. All right, let's go back to the next. Okay, that's everything for my tutorial. And uh, we also provide a few uh, exercises. If you're interested, uh, you can try this offline and uh, it provides some instructions for uh, how to implement the custom compression algorithm. And uh, we also provide potential valuable open research questions, including you know, try non-uniform quantization a lossless compression or you know adaptive compression represent. And if you're interested more in this uh, research uh, area, we also provide a few links uh, to the papers, which is really here. All right, uh, let's move on to the uh, story questions. All right, so the first, first question is, uh, why should we give the input stack to the ferret model? Can it just infer from the data set? Okay, I think this is a uh, very good question. It can infer from data set, but we need this uh, input stack when building the um, TFF Lambda model, which, you know, it hasn't go to the uh, client yet. We just need this information for building the model. But I think uh, anyone from uh, TFF team can give a more in-depth answer to this. <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, I uh, commented on it. Um, I think that we, as Wei Kang mentioned, I think we wanted to kind of decouple up a handle on the data set itself from the ability to uh, like define the model, you know, because these things are going to be happening very, you know, in different places, like across different platforms or whatever, um, in kind of the general case. Uh, and actually, we used to accept a dummy batch here uh, instead of an input spec and inferred the the data the the model is going to see from that dummy batch. But this is less general because um, a, a dummy batch is always going to have like concrete specified. Uh, you know, tensor sizes in each dimension, you might want to do things like padded batching where you are, uh, you know, where a bunch of things are going to be unspecified sizes uh, at the at the symbolic level and only specified, you know, later when data is actually fed in. So rather than um, couple like ownership of the data set that the model is going to ingest, we let, leave it up to users to to kind of pull the data set spec or the input spec off the data set and pass it in there. We think that that's the most general approach we, we got. Okay, thank you, Kiss. So I think uh, the next question will also need, <clears throat> I think you, you uh, also need you to respond. I think it's related to something uh, in uh, the implementation details of TFF. Yeah, I think that um, I was actually chatting with a couple of the other people offline here. Uh, I think that the fact, the observed behavior is a bug, I believe. Um, we actually, so, you know, uh, TFF is of course open source, but the uh, way that collabs are run, the backends internal and external are slightly different. And I noticed this behavior when we were looking at these collabs previously um, and the internal backend didn't reproduce it. So I assume that the latest TFF release would fix it because there's been a couple of changes that, that could affect this. 
Uh, I think that there must be a bug in the caching layer or something of TFF, which would cause the next computation to be executed twice or something like that. Um, but I, I haven't chased it down. So it's a great question, but I don't have a good answer. Yeah. Uh, so next, uh, can we use the same value for min max for all the clients? This may be useful for a uh, secure. Uh, I think the answer is yes. If you, uh, right now we just use the uh, very <clears throat> a few uh, arguments of the Tencent Coding API, but I think there are uh, more, you know, ways, there are ways you can customize the uh, encoder. For example, just set the mean and max value for each, uh, for, for the individual, uh, for, for every client. I think that's doable. If you're interested, please go to the Tencent Coding API uh, docs for more uh, information. Uh, is the input spec anyway relatable to the white noise? Uh, more than the definition? Uh, I'm not really quite familiar with this one. Looks like it's related to a differential privacy. Uh, anyone from our research team can answer this? I can maybe jump in for a second. I think this, uh, we, we might have to look at this GitHub uh, uh, example before we can answer, but we'll leave a comment on the Dory afterwards uh, to address this specifically. All right, thank you, Zach. So uh, now let's uh, move on to, let's welcome Zach Charles for his great tutorial about how to build your own uh, error process. Okay, uh, hopefully I'm unmuted and everybody can hear me all right. Um, so let's take a little bit of a, a stretch break because I know it's been a while. Thank you all so much for attending. This is the last talk uh, and it's gonna be a little bit different than the rest. Um, I'll get into that. Uh, and so let's just you know start up our collabs, connect to our session, load TensorFlow Federated, uh, and load some relevant libraries. Uh, and while that's happening, I wanna give you an overview of what I wanna talk about. And so the previous three uh, tutorials you saw primarily dealt with the TFF Learning API, which is really, really great if you just wanna get in and start trying experiments. You wanna try a simulation, you say, oh, I have this data, I have this great idea, I wanna try this optimizer, you know, what have you. Um, but the TFF Learning API, as some of the Dory questions have gotten at, is not the be all end all of federated learning algorithms, right? Like there's only so much that can go into an API without making it horrible. Um, and so if you want to go deeper, if you want to do something more complicated, you might actually have to implement your own custom federated learning algorithm. And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about. And so I have three goals in this talk uh, for you, <laughs> the listener. Uh, hopefully you come out of this understanding the general structure of federated learning algorithms. Uh, the second goal is just to explore the federated core of TFF a little bit. Uh, Chris talked about this in his intro, and I'm going to delve deeper into it. Um, what we're going to do is use this federated core to implement, uh, implement federated averaging directly. Okay, so first things first, we are going to start off with our input data, and we're going to pre-process the eMNIST data set. This is a federated MNIST data set. Uh, we're going to do it in basically the same way that was done in the first tutorial. So we're going to use the simulation API to load our data. Uh, I'm going to specify a number of clients and a batch size, and I'm going to do a pre-processing function that basically just flattens the pixels, uh, and I'm going to convert them, uh, the pixels and the label into a tuple. I'm going to batch it, and then I'm going to apply this uh, flattening function. Uh, and so let's wait for my code to load. Uh, great. And so now what we want to do is just sample a couple of clients that we can use later on down the line. Um, and Emily and Nova both talked more about this in detail. I'm not going to go to it too much in detail, but uh, remember that what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample my client IDs. These are identifiers for my clients, and I'm going to do it just using np.random, and I'm going to sample from the emnist train client IDs. This is kind of a list of identifiers for the clients. I'm going to sample num clients, and I'm going to do it without replacement. 
Once I've sampled that, I can make my federated data by just pre-processing these data sets and I use the create TF data set for client. Uh, and now I have my federated train data, which is a list of TF data sets. We're gonna prepare our model. It's gonna be a really, really simple model. It's the same one that we used in the first tutorial. Uh, it's gonna have a 784 input, that's 28 by 28. Uh, a lot of you who have played around with MNIST know this number quite a lot. Uh, it has a single dense layer followed by a softmax. And we're going to wrap this into a TFF.learning model. No big deal. Okay, so now let's get on to kind of the core of what I want to talk about. And it's that the TFF Learning API um, primarily implements things like federated averaging, uh, and you could do things like specify your custom optimizer function, but maybe you're interested in more uh, sophisticated methods. I just got a note that I should increase my text size a little bit, so let me do that. Uh, hopefully this is a little bit better for people. Uh, and so things that you might be interested in uh, implementing are things like uh, regularization, clipping, uh, oh, shouldn't double click, uh, I always forget that, uh, or something that, that maybe is on your window is uh, GANs. Uh, federated GANs are a really, really exciting research topic that we've put out some work on, and you might be interested in, in making your own. And so to do these, we're gonna have to really write our own custom FL algorithm. Uh, and in general, uh, FL algorithms have four main components. Uh, there's a server to client broadcast step. This is talked about in Wacom's tutorial. Uh, there's a local client update step. That's the client training on its own data. There's a client to server upload step. That's you know the, the server aggregating the client updates. And there's a server update step. The server says, oh, I saw these things from my client model. How am I gonna update my own model? And so this is a very, very simple diagram of the process. The server model here is broadcast to a bunch of clients clients do their local training in A. Uh, B kind of represents the end result of all these clients doing their training. The clients upload their model to the server, which is represented by this cloud here. Uh, and this cloud somehow updates its own model, that's C, and then repeat. So the way we're going to represent our federated algorithm uh, is as we've said before, an iterative process. Um, and iterative processes, this is an abstract based class that has an initialized function and a next function. The initialized function is just the server saying, I'm going to start my computation somehow. And the next function is running one round of the four steps that I outlined above. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to implement federated averaging over the course of this tutorial. Uh, and so we're going to first write kind of a skeleton of what it should look like. So the, the initialized function, this is just the server starting. It's going to start doing something. And for us, we're just going to initialize our model function and pull out the trainable weights. Uh, there's only trainable weights on our model, so that's not such a big deal. But I'm going to implement the initialized function the following way. Uh, I'm going to say model equals model function. Great, I instantiated my model. And I'm going to return the trainable model, model weights. Excellent, very easy. That's the server saying, let's get going. Uh, the harder part is the next function, and I want to sketch out what it's going to look like. It's going to have four steps. We talked about the four steps before. There is a broadcast step. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to broadcast the server weights to the client. Server weights at client equals broadcast of server weights. This is pseudocode, by the way, right now. We haven't implemented these functions, but we're going to. Once I have the server weights at the clients, I can then make the clients do their own local update, and I'm just going to say client weights equals client update and it's gonna take as input the federated data set and the server weights that are located now at the client after the broadcast step. The server is going to take all of the client weights and simply average them. It's gonna compute a mean. And then the server is gonna update its own weights using a server update function. Done, that is the next function. That is one round of my federated computation. We're gonna implement these four components separately. And what's really nice for those of you familiar with TensorFlow, is that two of these blocks can be implemented in pure TensorFlow. That's gonna be the client update function and the server update function. It's gonna look a lot like training functions that you've seen in TensorFlow if you have experience with that. So let's get going. The client update is gonna use our TFF learning model to do uh, training. And instead of deferring to the TFF.learning API, we're gonna to have to implement our learning directly and we're gonna use TF gradient tape. So this is back propagation for the people who are familiar with it. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're going to just compute the gradients using back prop, and we're going to apply the gradients 
using our client optimizer. Pretty easy. So let, let's let's dive into the code. And I've written out most of it already. Um, and I, I don't want to go too much into it because it is just TensorFlow code. So hopefully you've seen something like this before. But the client update uh, is going to take as input the model, some data set, the server weights. These are the ones that were broadcast from the server, and a client optimizer. I'm going to pull out the trainable weights of my model. I'm going to apply the server weights to them. So I'm going to assign them there. The, the client weights, I don't really care about the initial weights of my model. I care about what are the server weights. I'm going to start from there and then update. Then what I do is I just take a bunch of batches in my data set. I use gradient tape to compute the gradient. Uh, and the way that I do that is by saying outputs equals model dot forward pass. So this forward pass is something that's implemented in the TFF learning uh, models. Um, so this is something you can just call and say, I want to do a forward pass on my batch. Done. You get some outputs. The gradients, you just call tape.gradient. This is something that's pretty standard in TensorFlow training. Uh, and we're going to apply it to the loss function that's in our outputs. Uh, and it's going to be with respect to the client weights. We zip up the grads and the client weights. And then we're just going to apply them using our client optimizer. And again, this is going to look very similar to anybody who's seen uh, TensorFlow training. I'm just going to say client optimizer dot apply gradients of grads and bears. So what this does is this just applies the gradients to my client weights. And I return my client weights. Done. That is my client update function. OK, so this is a lot, but hopefully digestible for people with experience with TensorFlow. The server update is going to be even easier. Remember that the server update in federated averaging is not very complex. The server takes a mean of all the client weights, and it says, this is my new model. Forget what I had before. This is my new model. So my server update is going to take as input its current model and the mean of the client weights. And all I'm going to do is pull out the trainable weights in my model and assign the mean client weights. That's it. Done. So really, I'm just saying, forget what I had before. That was garbage. That's no longer useful. Take the mean of my client weights and use that. Um, this code is a little bit overkill. I could have just returned the mean client weights. Uh, but I've written this here as a skeleton in case you want to do a more sophisticated server update step. So for instance, one thing that you could think of doing is instead of saying, oh, my previous server model was garbage, my new client weight models are great, you could say, what about the midpoint between them? Right? Maybe that makes more sense. Maybe that's a little bit more of a conservative step. Um, and this is actually really, really analogous to something called the look ahead optimizer. I've posted a link in case you're interested. Uh, and I challenge you to implement that. Take the midpoint of the server weights and the mean client weights instead of doing what I've done up here. OK, but this has been pure TensorFlow code so far. And you're here for a TFF tutorial. Um, but the fact that we can use so much TensorFlow code is by design. TFF is, going, is supposed to allow us to use a lot of the TF code that you're familiar with in order to do uh, client training and server training. But in order to specify the orchestration logic, these are the things that bind these client and server updates together, we're going to actually have to use the federated core of TFF. So let's do a little diversion. We're going to give, uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to the federated core. This is kind of one of the main parts of TFF. Um, and the federated core is a set of lower level interfaces that are basically the foundation for the TFF Learning API. TFF Learning API uses the federated core to define the things that were talked about in the previous uh, tutorials, but you can use them directly. Um, and so the, the, the kind of goal, and, and Chris mentioned this in his talk, is that what we want to do is combine TensorFlow code with distributed communication operators. And this is things like uh, broadcasting and distributed averaging. Um, and we want to give you explicit control over the distributed communication without requiring system level implementation details, right? Like probably you don't want to have to specify point to point network communication. That's just too much. Um, and the other thing that's really important is that TFF is designed for privacy preservation. So it's going to be very explicit about where data resides. And this helps prevent unwanted accumulation of data at places like the server. And at first, it might seem weird to have all this explicit data control. But just remember, it's in, the, uh, in service of privacy preservation. So in TensorFlow, 
we have you know tensors. These are kind of this fundamental thing that we use everywhere. Uh, in TFF instead, a key concept is federated data. And what this refers to is a collection of data items distributed somewhere in your system. Um, and so what happens is that we will model an entire collection of data items across all devices as a single federated value. So for instance, if my clients have a bunch of temperatures, if there are a bunch of sensors in the network with temperatures, I'm going to model all of their temperatures as a single federated value. Um, and the way this works is that we're going to have a float representing the temperature of the sensor, and it's going to be actually a federated float. And I've defined it here, federated float on clients. It's a tff.federated type, and there's two aspects to it. There's the tf.float32. This is saying, what kind of data type is it? It's a float32. The second aspect is saying, where does this data reside? And this tff.clients is telling me, oh, it resides at the clients, as opposed to the server. And so federated types uh, represented by a type T, like float32, and a group G of devices, that's tff.clients. And we can look at this type signature just by calling string of my federated float. And so let's look at what our type signature looks like. It looks like float32 at clients. Pretty self-explanatory. And so the reason that I'm harping on this so much is that, again, I want to know where my data is at any given time. Um, and so TFF focuses on three things, data, the float 32, where the data is placed, that's clients, and how the data is being transformed. We haven't gotten to that yet, but to talk about how data is being transformed, we're going to need federated computations. So. Federated computations. TFF is a strongly typed functional programming environment. This was talked about by Chris. And since it's a functional programming environment, its central unit are federated computations. These accept federated values, like our float32 at clients from above, and they return federated values. So that you go from a federated value to a federated value. I apologize, I might be cut off. I gesticulate a lot when I talk, so hopefully uh, the, the hand motions are not necessary to understand. OK, so as an example of a federated computation, let's say again that we're going to have a bunch of sensors that have temperatures on them, and we just want to compute an average. We're going to define the following federated computation. Uh, and it's get average temperature. It's going to take as input my client temperatures, and it's going to use tff.federated mean of those client temperatures. So it's going to compute a mean. Now, the really important thing here is that we have this type annotation at the beginning. We have this at tff.federated computation. And then we say, OK, here is the federated type that we are expecting as input. So what I pass into get average temperature has to be a federated type of type float32 at clients. And so what's important is that this is not quite a tf.function uh, decorator, which you might be familiar with. Um, this goes to what Chris was talking about, where TFF is secretly three languages. There's TensorFlow, there's Python, but then there's something that's neither. It's kind of a glue language. Um, but the thing that, that, to abstract away from all of that, you should just think of TFF computations as functions with really well-defined type signatures telling you where data starts and where it ends up. So let's look at the type signature of our third computation. It takes the float32 that was at the clients, it applies this federated mean and uploads it to the server. So it starts with a float32 at clients and it ends with a float32 at the server. Uh, and, and the fact that it goes from client to server is baked into federated mean. There are other things we could do if we wanted to compute an average of the clients uh, and then send it back to all the clients. Um, OK. And so uh, now to actually start debugging a little bit, uh, TFF does allow you to invoke these federated computations as just a Python function. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our get average temperature function, and we're just going to call it on a list of floats. Let's say my temperatures are uh, 20.1. I'm trying to be in Celsius uh, here, but I'm actually very bad at Celsius. So I hope that this is like a moderate temperature. Uh, 18.5. So maybe these are the temperatures of my sensor. And I call get average temperature. And look, I get 19.266668. Um, I can't do the math in my head, but this looks like the mean. So everything is good. OK. Now let's bring in TensorFlow. And there's before we bring in TensorFlow, there are some really, really important things to note. 
Um, the first is that TFF computations are non-eager. So for those of you who love eager mode in TF, um, you can use it to some degree in TFF, but TFF computations as a general rule of thumb are not eager. The second is that federated computations should only consist of federated operators. These are things like the tff.federated mean that we saw before. They cannot contain TensorFlow operations directly. Instead, what we do is we first put TensorFlow code into blocks that are annotated with tff.tf computation. Um, and it's really, you can just take standard TensorFlow code and annotate it with this and it works perfectly fine. So as, as an example, we have a really simple function here that takes as input x and it adds 0 0.5 to it. And all I've done is I've added a decorator that says it's a TF computation and it's going to accept a float 32. And I've put it here because of the strongly typed nature of TFF. So let's define our function. And now, just like the federated computations, these have type signatures, but they don't have placements. They're just abstract TF code. So the type signature of this TF computation, it takes in a float 32, and the function is traced through when you put this decorator, and it knows it's going to output a float 32. Pretty easy. And what's nice is that the TensorFlow code can go at the server or at the client. That's why we've kind of omitted uh, placements within this type signature. So again, the difference between federated computations and TF computations, the former has explicit placements, the latter does not. To use a TF computation within an actual federated computation, we're going to use tff.federated map, which basically just applies a TF computation while preserving the placement. So as an example, we had this function before that added one half to elements. And I'm going to design a version now that is going to apply the function to client temperatures. It's going to say, I have all these temperatures at my clients, this tf.flow32 at clients, and I want to add 0 0.5 to all of them. So it's pretty easy to do so. Uh, I am just going to say, return tff.federated map. This is saying, apply the tf computation. I care about the add half function. I'm going to apply it to x. Done. So let's look at its type signature. And it takes in a float 32 at clients and it spits out a float 32 at clients where all the clients have had their temperature incremented by one half. So this has been a pretty short introduction to the federated core, but I have just a couple lessons that I think are really important to keep in mind. TFF operates on federated values. Federated values have a federated type such as float 32 and a placement such as clients. Federated values are transformed using federated computations, which have to be decorated with the tff.federated computation and a type signature. To use TensorFlow code, you first put them in TF computation direct, uh, decorators, and then you can incorporate them into federated computations generally through tff.federated map. All right, let's pause. Let's stretch a little bit. We understand the federated core a little bit. And if some of what I said didn't make sense, don't worry. We have very, very in detail tutorials on the website. Um, but this is really just supposed to be kind of exposure to these concepts. But let's go back to implementing federated averaging. Um, remember above that we had this iterative process and we needed to define two things. We needed our initialize function and our next function. And the next function is going to use the TensorFlow that we've already defined in our client update and our server update. Again, those were pure TensorFlow blocks. Now, in order to make our algorithm actually federated, we need both the next function and the initialize function to be federated computations. Because fundamentally, they're going to take things that are either at the client or the server and put them either at the client or the server. So let's write our TensorFlow federated blocks. We're going to first deal with the initialization computation. Um, and remember that we, we want to initialize our model. We have this model function uh, that we have that we're just going to instantiate it. And so to write the corresponding tff.tf computation, what we're going to do is say, OK, I'm going to write a tff.tf computation. That's my decorator. And I'm going to define my server initialize function. My server is going to call the model function, and it's going to return the model.weights.trainable. OK, this is just a, a standard warning. It doesn't really matter. Um, you'll notice that this is exactly the same initialize function that we did before, but with a TF computation decorator. That's it. We just slap that on, and we're good to go. 
Now we can turn this into a federated computation using tff.federated value. And what tff.federated value does is it takes something that doesn't have a placement and it gives it a placement. So my federated computation now is going to take the server init function and just place it on the server. And we've now created our federated initialize function. The next function sounds harder, but it's not going to be that much harder. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to uh, turn our client update function, which was pure TensorFlow, um, and we're going to turn it into a tff.tf computation. And remember, it needs to accept two things. It needs to accept the client data set and the server weights, and it outputs an updated client weights. So we will need to decorate our function using type signatures, but we can actually extract them pretty automatically from our model. Remember, we have our model function, so I'm going to instantiate it and then our dummy model. And I can extract the necessary type just by calling input spec on my dummy model. And this is part of the reason, getting to a question in the previous tutorial, why we pass in the input spec. Because uh, we can actually use it before we've even seen any data on the model. So let's look at the type signature. Remember that our model takes as input these 28 by 28 images with integer labels uh, that have been flattened. And so if you look at the type signature, of my TF data set. It's a float32 with a question mark 784. This question mark refers to kind of a variable batch size. I don't know what the batch size is going to be. It can depend. 784 is the dimension of the tensors. My int32 again has a question mark because I don't know the batch size. And one, that's the label. Uh, I'm also going to extract the model weights type by using our server init function above. Remember, we defined a federated computation above that was our server init. And just by calling its type signature, I can get the type of my model weights. Uh, and again, that's by doing type signature dot result. And so let's just look at that. My model weights look like this. My first layer has a float32 uh, 784 10. This is my uh, input layer that maps my 784 flattened vectors to a 10 dimensional output layer. This over here, this float32 10, these are the biased units. So again, these are the weights. These are the, bi these are the biases. You can exactly see our model architecture in the type signature. To create the TF computation for our client update, we first give the correct decorator. This is a tff.tf computation. And I put in the TF data set type that I had above and the model weights type above. And note that they exactly correspond to the inputs of my client update function. The TF data set has type TF data set type. The server weights have model weights type. And so to actually do the client update function, we're going to use our TF code above. But first, I just instantiate my model. I instantiate my client optimizer. And I use my client update function. And just a quick note, I am instantiating my model and my client optimizer outside of the client update function, because the client update function is a tf.function, and you can't create variables within the scope of a tf.function. Um, there's some great tutorials on the TensorFlow uh, website about tf.functions and what you can and can't do and why you should and shouldn't use certain practices. I'm not going to go to it, into it in depth, but it's just something to be aware of, uh, tf.functions. OK, so this was the client update function. And we're going to do exactly the same thing, but with the server update function. We're going to, I'm going to walk you through it. So we want a TF computation for my server. So let's start with at tff.tf computation. OK. And the thing that was important to remember, if you go back up to the server weights, uh, the, the server update function, I don't want to go back because I don't want to confuse anybody. But the server update function we defined above accepted exactly one thing. It accepted the mean of all the client weights. So it's going to have to accept something of model weights type. So this is my TF computation annotator. And I'm going to define my server update function. And it's going to accept my mean client weights. And I'm going to do something very similar to what I did above. I'm going to first instantiate my model. And I'm going to return my server update of my model and my mean client weights. OK, now, uh, one thing that is important 
uh, to note is that there's a little bit of an asymmetry here. Um, the client optimizer here doesn't have a parallel here. Um, I'm doing a very simple form of federated averaging where I don't use a server optimizer, but um, in general, you could imagine doing much more. Okay, so now I wanna finish up my algorithm. We've really, we've talked about converting my client update, my server update into TF computations, but we really need to bring it all together now. And so I wanna remind you all of the four elements of an FL algorithm. There's the server to client broadcast step. There's a local client update step. There's a client to server upload step and there's a server update step. Really we've dealt with two and four. We've turned them into TF computations. Now we're going to create a next function that uses all four of these. Um, and to do so, I'm gonna need some federated types because it's gonna be a federated computation. Uh, and these are gonna be my server type. This is uh, basically a federated version of the model weights type that's placed at server. And I'm gonna need a federated data set type. This is a federated version of the TF data set type that's placed at clients. Um, I would uh, recommend going back over this after the tutorial to maybe understand a little bit more in depth. Um, but if this part is a little bit confusing right now, don't worry too much about it. What I wanna do is I wanna write my next function. This is the thing that takes my server weights and my federated data set, and it does one round of federated averaging. And remember my four steps above. The first is gonna be a server to client broadcast step. And this is really easy. I'm going to say server weights at client equals tff.federated broadcast of my server weights. That's all I need to do. That's now telling my federated computation, hey, these server weights, they were placed at the server. If I do a federated broadcast, they're now placed at all the clients. So that's why I call it server weights at client. We're then going to use our client update function above to let our clients compute their updated weights. And remember that this, this client update function is a TF computation. So I'm just gonna say my client weights are gonna be tff.federated map of the client update function and the specific input. And there's two inputs, there's the federated data set and this is the server weights at the clients. Uh, I don't wanna just put in the server weights there because these server weights lie at the server, they don't lie at the clients. I need to pass in these ones that were explicitly placed at the client. And again, federated map just applies this update function. Now, the third part, I'm gonna take a federated mean of these client weights. And this is pretty simple too. I am just gonna say mean client weights equals tff.federated mean of my client weights. Great, that's all it took to compute the federated mean of my client weights. And now what this is doing implicitly is it is taking something that was placed at the client and now placing it at the server. That's part of what federated mean does. Last but not least, the server is gonna update its own weights. It's gonna use tff.federated map of the server update function on the mean client weights. I'm just gonna return my updated server weights. Uh, oh, I didn't, sorry, I did not hit that collab button. Great, let's do that. That was a type signature error. Uh, I hadn't instantiated these yet, but these are just the federated types corresponding to the inputs of the next function. Okay, but long story short, I just wanna emphasize something here. Our next function really, if you talk about the orchestration logic of my federated algorithm, kind of what is happening, how is data being passed around in my system, there was really only four lines and they corresponded exactly to the four elements of an FL algorithm. I broadcast, I do client update, I do my client, I take a federated mean, and I do my server update. And so this is part of the power of TFF, is this compact expression of what is kind of complicated, uh, distributed logic, pretty easy. So now we have our federated computation for the algorithm initialization and for the next function. And so to actually create my federated algorithm, I'm gonna use an iterative process, I'm gonna specify specify my initialize function and my next function. Okay, so that's it. We now have our federated algorithm. This is something that we can initialize it and then we can run next function in order to update the weights. We can do that repeatedly or iteratively. So let's look at the type signature of both of these functions, the initialize and the next functions. If we look at the 
string of the federated algorithm's initialized type signature, we see that that does not take any input. The initialized does not have any input whatsoever, which makes sense. And it outputs this at server. And remember that this is the type signature without placement of my model. It has a dense weights and it has the bias units and it's placed at server. If we look at the string of the next type signature, it looks a little more complicated, but let's digest it. It takes as input two things. This is the model weights placed at the server, and this is the client data sets. Remember, my client data sets have 784 uh, dimensional vectors and one dimensional labels, and they're placed at the clients. And what it returns is now this, which again is a new model weights placed at the server. So again, this is just saying it accepts a server model, client data, and it returns an updated server model. And I can reason explicitly about where things should be placed in order to use this. So let's actually evaluate it now. And we're gonna evaluate it in a really similar way to uh, how evaluation was done in previous uh, tutorials. Um, I'm gonna do a really simple form of evaluation where I do centralized evaluation. So I'm gonna take a single data set that I'm gonna use to uh, evaluate. Uh, and I do this by taking my test data set and creating a TF data set from all clients. I'm just going to take a thousand elements to make evaluation faster, but in general, you would want to use the whole data set. And I'm going to apply my pre-processing function to this test data set. Great. Um, I've written here a very simple function that all it does is it takes the server state, which is these model weights, and it uses Keras to evaluate on the test data set. Um, if you're used to TF Keras, this is going to look really, really simple. Uh, I create my Keras model. I compile it. The only difference now is I'm going to set the weights according to what's in my server state, and then I'm going to evaluate. I'm going to use Keras model.evaluate. So this is my evaluation function. So now let's initialize our algorithm and evaluate on the test set. Again, we're going to call federated algorithm.initialize initialize, and see what the evaluation gives us. OK. So we have a loss of 2.3 and an accuracy of 0.1. Uh, note that there's only 10 labels. So this is telling me that I'm doing no better than guessing at random. So let's train for a few rounds and hope that things change. Uh, so let's do a couple of rounds. Let's do 15 rounds. I'm going to say server state equals federated algorithm. Remember, this is our algorithm represented as an iterative process. I'm going to call my next function, and I'm going to use give as input my server state. And way above, uh, this was uh, a long time ago, hopefully you remember, but we defined a federated train data. This was a list of TF data set objects. And so now I'm going to be running what we defined uh, above, those four elements of my algorithm. They're going to be run 15 times. Uh, my collab is acting pretty slow right now. So hopefully this doesn't take too, too long. Great. So it ran 15 rounds of my algorithm. And let's just do some evaluation. All right, Karis. All right. Great. OK. So let's compare. I had a loss of 2.3 when I just initialized. Now I have a loss of 2.16. We had an accuracy of 0 0.1. Now I have an accuracy of 0 0.25. So I'm doing better than simply guessing at random. Um, but again, it's worth noting that, that I've only done 15 rounds and on a couple of clients. I've barely seen any data. I don't think I've done a single epoch yet, if you think in terms of centralized learning. So you might have to do hundreds or thousands of rounds to actually get something comparable to centralized accuracy. But that's it. We've implemented federated averaging. And we've evaluated and we see that it works. It actually did increase our accuracy. Um, and the way that we created it, this algorithm, I just want to like stop and reflect. I want to give you the afternoon school special uh, viewpoint of what we've done. We implemented federated averaging by combining pure TensorFlow code, this is for the client server updates, with federated computations from the federated core of TFF. So the pure TensorFlow code was used for the things that you think it's going to be used for. It's used for training models using gradients and back propagation. TensorFlow is great at that. The federated core was for the non-TensorFlow aspects. They were for telling uh, the federated computation, well, where is data placed? How should it be placed after this 
uh, transformation, um, things like broadcasting, aggregation, federated means, that kind of thing. Um, but to create a more sophisticated algorithm, we actually have a lot of really useful tools now. Uh, we can just simply alter a lot of what we have above to make it more sophisticated. So for instance, if you want to just edit the pure TensorFlow code above, you can change how the client actually performs its training. If you're interested in adding in a weird regularizer, or if you're interested in doing uh, gradient clipping, um, you can implement that directly in your client update function. No need to play around with the TFF code, just change your TF code. If you wanted to make larger changes, you might have to actually change though the TFF code. So for instance, we could make the server not just store the model weights, but also store more than that. We can make it store, for instance, the client learning rate and make that decay over time. So maybe the hundredth time I call next on my iterative process, I want the client learning rate to decay by a factor of one half. This is going to require some changes to what we did. It's going to require some changes to some type signatures. Um, but it's really not so bad once you understand what's going on. Um, and so kind of a harder challenge for you if you're interested, implement federated averaging with learning rate decay on the clients. Uh, and so if you're interested in learning how to do these kinds of things, um, I'd recommend checking out. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the more sophisticated version is the tff.learning.buildfederatedaveraging process. Uh, or you can check out various research projects using TFF. Uh, in particular, uh, we also have an example section on our GitHub that uh, has something called simple fed, fed average, which is a very simple implementation of federated averaging, which I recommend checking out. Okay, and with that, I am done. So let's move on to Dory questions. Okay, can you please elaborate on asynchronous communication with the server? It seems that the custom model yet imposes the synchronous update. You are right that what we wrote uh, was very synchronous, both in the TFF learning API and in the algorithm that we just wrote. Um, I think it's a really open question of how asynchronicity should be used in federated learning. Um, you could try to simulate asynchronicity using a custom iterative process, uh, but I, I, I suspect that a lot of thinking needs to go into it. Um, I don't have any references offhand, but um, yeah, I, I encourage you to definitely think about this uh, and do some digging. Maybe somebody has a better answer than I do. Is it possible to define different classes of clients instead of just clients that might treat their data local, their local data slightly differently? Maybe a set of two clients? Okay. Uh, yeah, so this question is asking about like, well, what if we have different tiers of clients? Like maybe we have some clients that have very powerful devices that we can do lots and lots of sophisticated things. And maybe we have clients that have very uh, minuscule devices that can't do very much. Um, I think this is a really good question. You could definitely do this with your own custom iterative process. So for instance, instead of just having indicators uh, for the client data, you could also have as input to the algorithm, uh, some kind of, let's say, integer, specifying 0, 1, or 2, kind of levels of your clients. And you could have the training loop depend on that input. So yes, that definitely is possible within TFF. You have prevent, presented us FL as a way to train models on edge devices in an industrial context where we have a batch of uh, similar machines at different plants, which would train together a federated model. How would you imagine specializing each model to fit on a particular plant? Yeah, so this is really a question about cross silo FL and, and how cross silo FL might differ from cross device FL. Um, I, I, this is a very good question. I, it's hard to come up with a short answer to it. Um, I suspect that one thing that might happen is that you would want to do uh, more local training in a cross silo setting than you would in a cross device setting, just because cross device, you have so many devices and they're pretty lightweight. Um, cross silo, you would probably want to do something more sophisticated. Uh, there's definitely so much active research on cross silo FL right now. I would encourage you to uh, do, do kind of a search on, on Google Scholar or whatever uh, and, and dig up some references. I'm sorry that I don't have a good one for you offhand. Can we do a weighted average by knowing the number of client update samples? Absolutely, this is a really good point that I wish I had talked about. Uh, Mona, thank you very much. Um, 
I did a federated averaging that was purely uniform. Uh, I did not specify any weights. However, the TFF.federated mean does accept a, an argument that dictates how much each client should be weighted during the averaging. Um, so one thing that we could have done, and you'll see this if you dig into some of the examples we have in TFF, we could have also computed the number of examples seen by the client and used that to say, okay, this is how much my client is going to be weighted. Um, there's lots of other interesting ways that you can weight clients. Uh, and so for an example on how to do this, uh, definitely check out simple Fed average, which is in the example section on our GitHub. All right. Federated learning seems like it will almost always be heterogeneous hardware. Is there a way to scale the steps batch size by types of connected clients? Yeah, so, so this was touched on in a separate question. Um, you could imagine uh, an FL setting where clients don't just have a data set, they have some kind of value that indicates how powerful their hardware is and change the training loop based on that. Um, you can definitely simulate that in TFF right now uh, by making the client update function depend not just on the client data, but on some extra parameter that is essentially how powerful the device is. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of active uh, research on how the number of steps and batch size influence things. Um, I'm going to be really self-aggrandizing here and say that I have a paper related to this called uh, on the outsized importance of learning rates in uh, local update methods. But but honestly, there's so many great references on this. Uh, I would actually what I actually recommend doing is checking out the survey paper we put out last year called Advances in Open Problems in Federated Learning. Um, there's definitely discussion of this kind of thing. Can you please elaborate on how one can modify the data while the model is trained? E.g., when generating adversarial samples, one need to use a currently trained model to find an adversarial sample. How can one implement such adversarial samples on the fly for the federated learning setting? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and so this kind of adversarial training cannot be done directly in the TFF Learning API. Instead, you would have to use kind of the uh, methodology I presented to make your own custom algorithm. So what we showed above in our client update, if I go all the way, oh, well, no, no, I'm looking at the door I can't present right now. Um, we had this pure TensorFlow code that was just pretty simple. It was computer gradient, use that gradient to update. What I could have done instead is I could have said, uh, compute uh, an adversarial example then compute the gradient with respect to that adversarial example. So you could just modify the TensorFlow code in there in order to do adversarial training. But it does require implementing your own custom FL algorithm. Yeah, thank you. Is there an abstraction in TFF for sending data between clients? Uh, yeah, so this is a good question. Um, so what I didn't mention is that there are uh, different placements. Uh, you could define a different placement, for instance, in TFF instead of just clients or server. However, currently, um, server and clients are kind of the things we focus on, and clients are treated uniformly. Um, so uh, the reason that we don't necessarily want to send data between clients is because that can violate data privacy. Um, but this is definitely something that, that, that could be investigated um, in the future. Uh, it, it might just be difficult to reconcile it with a lot of privacy issues. Is it possible to do client weight averaging on the client side without aggregating them on the server? Hmm. OK, I have to pause and think about that a little bit. Um, I'm not sure that this is directly possible in the framework that I presented. Uh, in particular, uh, we the way that I presented the algorithm is that it works server goes to client, clients do update, clients go back to server, server updates. So you would need some methodology to have all the clients know about all the other clients' models in order to do that. Um, and you could definitely simulate that in, in TFF, but I, I, I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how that, that fits in with, with privacy issues. Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I would need to think more about that. Um, and as far as multiple servers, how would they work in an FL framework? 
this is a good question. Uh, there's already some support for uh, kind of hierarchical aggregation in TFF. Um, I might ask for Keith to jump in and talk a little bit about that. Oh, sorry, I was spacing out again on a different door question. What was the question? No, here? no, no worries. Uh, it's about um, multiple servers in FL, and I, I, I wanted to see if you would touch on kind of hierarchical aggregation in TFF. Yeah, TFF does have hierarchical aggregation um, as a feature. It's not one that I know super well. It's actually, I think, one we're probably going to be hardening um, in the immediate future. But I think that the conceptual model is really single server, and it's like, you know, um, kind of an implementation detail that the server can be literally distributed across multiple machines in order to, you know, reduce, like, you know, avoid, let's say, linear costs of, of, of scaling or whatever. I don't know if that answered the question, maybe. I, I, I think so. Um, cool. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Any work done on detecting slash blocking malicious clients? Thanks. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a good question. Um, there's a lot of active research uh, on what happens with malicious clients. Um, we have in our research repository two examples that might be relevant. Uh, one is robust aggregation. So this is using instead of uh, averaging, using things like medians to help negate the influence of malicious clients. Uh, and the other is a library that talks about how to actually do this malicious client attack and uh, defenses against it stemming from differential privacy. Um, I don't think that we've done any work on detecting, mainly because detecting might violate some, some privacy issues. Um, I think it's a really good question. Uh, if you're interested in this, by the way, the Advances in Open Problems and Federated Learning paper we put out last year has a really, really good section on this. Is it true to say peer-to-peer -peer type of distributed learning isn't possible in the current version of TFF? Uh, will, will there always need to be a server, a trusted central aggregator? Is this on the roadmap? Uh, okay, this is out of my wheelhouse. Uh, does somebody on the TFF team maybe want to comment? Uh, um, yeah. Uh, it, so TFF kind of, um, I guess, uh, you see the, the broadcast in this, in this, actually what's on the screen right now, right? That delegates internally to a TFF in, uh, construct called an, an intrinsic that has a particular type signature that says, okay, take whatever is at the server and put it on the clients, essentially. Um, TFF does not currently have any intrinsics that have a client's, like clients on the left, clients on the right, besides essentially mapping a function. So there's basically no client to client communication intrinsic, but TFF is designed to express such a thing. So TFF can express this. It's not like a fundamental limitation of the type system or the design or anything. Um, whether it's on the roadmap or not, I actually, I don't, I don't know that anybody knows the answer to that. It's designed, TFF is designed such that it could be on the roadmap. So I guess that answer is, is no, it's not on the immediate roadmap. Um, but yeah, I, it's something that I think we'd be open to thinking about. I mean, I would like to add here that uh, this is not what we necessarily refer to as a federated setting, because commonly what we refer to as a federated learning type setting is one where there is a central orchestrator. So this orchestration back and forth between a service provider and clients uh, really is what one of the defining characteristics of a federated learning. Uh, I think this is a fully decentralized learning setting, and it's an exciting one, but it's not exactly federated learning. Thank you both. Is it possible to run training slash inference of multiple models on the same client? Yes, definitely. And this is part of the advantage to having defined our own iterative process. Um, I showed you how to train a single model, but you could easily take what I did and just slap in a different model. Maybe there's another model you want to train simultaneously. Um, so yes, definitely possible. Is it possible to define different cost functions for different clients? An attacker performing poisoning, backdoor and federated learning. Um, so I'm assuming, I'm going to assume in my answer to this question, uh, by cost, you mean loss function. Um, and so, this is this is a good question. Um, I think it is technically possible. Um, 
I think it's a little, you, you would have to be a little bit creative in how you do it. However, uh, we talked before about how to identify different clients and say maybe if the client uh, it, it has a one associated with them, do this training loop. And if the client has a two associated with them, do this training loop. You could imagine doing a similar thing, but for the models um, or for the loss function. So this is definitely possible. Um, but uh, for maybe more TFF friendly ways of how to do this, I would recommend checking out the research repository and examples of how to do backdoor attacks that are in there. I've noticed TFF uses, used gRPC. Can we extend this to production? Will there be support for other protocols like MPI? Uh, yeah, uh, would someone from the TFF team want to comment on this? I can maybe jump in on this. Um, yeah, this is Zach from the TFF team. Of the other Zach. Uh, can we extend this to production? Um, I think at this point, TFF is kind of a framework on top, and people can implement additional systems underneath and combine them with other technologies. Uh, I think there was an earlier question about kind of verifiable computing. Um, yes, that, uh, I don't know if the TFF team has that and on the immediate roadmap, but can we, like we as a, a group of, of humans? Yes, we can. <laughs> Uh, will there be support for the protocols like MPI? That's also uh, probably not on the near-term roadmap, but definitely the execution stack uh, allows alternative implementations of, of the protocols under the hood, and that's very encouraged. It's probably a bit off topic. What are your thoughts on fault tolerance of the TFF server? Uh, I remember you had a multi-tiered hierarchical aggregation network structure in production as explained in the towards federated learning at scale system design paper. Uh, yeah, I might also need to phone a friend for this one, uh, Keith or other Zach. Man, you guys are asking some wild systems questions here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, TFF is not what runs, uh, you know, production federated learning at, at Google currently. I think that um, the pushing fault tolerance of, of the TFF native execution stack is actually something that is on the immediate roadmap. I don't know that I personally am going to be working on it, um, but I know that people are looking at it. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got for that one. Great. Uh... Does it need to load all client weights into memory to calculate the mean? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, I, the short answer is no. Um, but uh, for the longer answer, I might still defer to uh, Keith. Uh, but but yeah, like on a short level, we have different executors that 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 uh, will execute this code in different ways. Uh, and one of the ways is to do more uh, intermediate aggregation to avoid exactly these problems. Uh, yeah, the, definitely not always. Um, if you are running on a single machine, I think that this might happen by default, but I, I think we should consider it an implementation detail. Uh, it's certainly not part of, part of any contract. And if you run in a distributed setup, especially with intermediate aggregation, then yeah, there's going to be, there should be no true linear scaling pretty much anywhere. That might not be literally true, but if it if it exists, it's something we'd like to root out and get rid of. The computation protobufs don't seem to restrict the placement to clients and server. Is this restriction something that is a feature of the Python API and the simulation runtime? Uh, Ooh, this is a very detailed question that, that might go better back to Keith or Zach. I was very excited to see this question on the door. This is an excellent question. Um, somebody really went deep into the interns with TFF to you know figure a bunch of stuff out. I'm very surprised that somebody <laughs> honestly figured this out with such speed. Um, yeah, TFF is not this TFF is designed to potentially extend to other placements. Um, Essentially, the server clients thing, yeah, basically is a feature of the current Python implementation. Um, there's another comment on there from, from somebody else, I believe, who mentions that there are implicit dependencies other places in the stack. That's also definitely true. So uh, TFF can be extended to other placements. I think that there is probably a long-term design to, to do this. 
I don't know if there's any concrete plans to do it. I think that there's probably not, um, not currently, but I, I think that probably it will happen. Uh, and we'll see a lot of my code is going to have to be rewritten if, <laughs> when we do this, I think so. Um, but yeah, gr amazing question. Could you elaborate on what makes tf.federated incompatible with eager execution? What subparts would be compatible? Yeah, so uh, I'm not going to go too, too much into depth in this. Um, but what I want to say is that uh, when the Python interpreter encounters a federated computation decorator, um, the function is traced and serialized for future use. Um, so, so that is fundamentally why federated computations are, are non-eager. Uh, but you, you can do some execution in an eager manner. Um, so I, I don't want to go too much into the weeds here. There's a great tutorial uh, on the TFF uh, tutorials webpage. Uh, I believe it's Federated Core 1 um, that, that talks more about that in depth. Uh, if there are any comments from the TFF team that you want to interject now, uh, please do so. But uh, yeah. I I might jump. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Zach. Go ahead. I might jump in real quick on that question and mention that um, in, in eager mode, there, there's kind of differences in semantics you get kind of Python code order semantics. And the same thing happens when you wrap in a TF function decorator. And that's still completely compatible with TFF federate. You can call tf.functions inside of your tff.tf computations, and you get the kind of code order semantics you expect. Um, one thing to think about with kind of graph mode versus eager mode is these computations run out on devices. Um, and eager mode kind of assumes that you have some global context locally. And so this there's kind of a conflict of, of concepts here, and that's why we typically run in, in what we call kind of non-eager, kind of traced, and then executed later uh, semantics. Could you please elaborate what tff.tf computation decorator does under the hood to convert Python code into TF computations? Uh, this is a phenomenal question that would require another half hour tutorial at least, uh, but maybe Zach or Keith can give like a very short answer. Um, yeah, I actually responded to this one as well. Another great, another great question. Um, I think as we kind of just mentioned in the, the answer to the previous one, uh, you know, so, so TFF is designed to whatever serialize everything immediately. It's got to run in this cross-platform way, uh, which means that we need to make all the logic independent of Python immediately. So it's effectively what the TFF TF computation decorator does is drops into a graph context, records all the um, TF operations that are happening in this graph context, uh, computes bindings into and out of this graph in order to be able to run the resulting thing as a function, and then just like spits the resulting serialized object out to TFF. And actually, this is what's happening when you invoke your TF computation is effectively, uh, actually, TFF is importing it into the eager runtime, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But you can imagine that TFF is actually such not running this graph. Um, yeah, I left a code pointer in the comment if any if anyone's interested there. Okay, that's the end of the question. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Peter to give maybe a couple of closing remarks. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks Zach, and thanks everyone who actually attended today's tutorial. Um, we're almost done. Um, hopefully, you know you thought this is very interesting. And hopefully you'll look at the links that we've uh, provided throughout the tutorial. Please continue to check our website, the tutorials website. We're going to hopefully post some additional information and uh, more links. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, all the presenters, Emily, Nova, Wacom, and Zach. They worked really hard to put all these tutorials together. Hopefully you enjoyed them. I would like to also uh, thank uh, Chris, Keith Rush, and um, Zach Garrett for uh, participating as well in Q&A and introducing some of these uh, concepts. Uh, in addition, I would like to thank the University Relations team at Google who have helped us tremendously, the events and production team uh, who are behind the scenes making this possible. I hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of, of today. Bye.